Lily Bunny and the Secret of a Happy Life. Preface. Who is this Lily Bunny anyway? As a matter of fact, questions such as who are you have existed since the day of creation. Our Lord, after getting his hands dirty in the clay, molded the bearded muzzle of Adam, and when this little chump had hardly opened his eyes, he reached up to God's nose, asking, Who are you? God did not answer. God has still not answered. Perhaps he was offended, or is still thinking about the question. Thus, of course, expecting the legitimate question, Who is this lily bunny anyway? I present you with the following explanatory conversation because readers indeed love books with a lot of conversation and pictures, and I don't want to disappoint you from the first page. Who is this Lily Bunny? Is he that important to write, or even worse, read novels about? We have never heard of him. Did he kill 50 million people? No. But did he participate in any massacres? Nope. Did he invent the A-bomb? No, he did not. Did he drop an A-bomb? One of those who dropped the A-bomb was recently declared a hero by Time magazine. No, Lily Bunny didn't drop the A-bomb. Maybe Lily Bunny is the kind of bearded guy, like Karl Marx, that invents the kind of theory that makes a couple of continents almost strangle themselves? No. Well, would you excuse us, but this personality is unremarkable, because it is necessary to murder a certain number of souls in order to be considered a great hero or even a historically significant figure. I'll try to argue that Lily Bunny is an ordinary character, with the virtues of anyone trying successfully to live a happy life, but you won't listen. You'll turn away. My novel will stomp in the corner, sniveling. You'll go on with your life, through your uneventful working days between traffic jams and washing machines, proving my novel to be unimportant. Actually, you don't realize that novels are guiding your lives. Look out at the street. Do you see Harry Potters carrying their brooms? Raskolnikovs with their axes, Pickwicks sitting on the benches, Captain's Nemos hiding silently somewhere in the city sewers. Each of us selects, subconsciously, a character from a novel read in one's childhood, and then this person hobbles through one's life. You might say that the present generation does not read any literature. They simply read new novels or watch the movies, which does the same simple trick. These books and movies rule our lives. As a matter of fact, this is a novel for you. It will treat your anxieties, make your back pain go away, and help you work healthy insight into your life. This is true, of course, only if you haven't been so abused and neglected before you reach these lines that it is already too late to help you out. In that case, you will carry on with your miserable life, dragging Raskolnikov's axes to kill old ladies for money. Or maybe you will play the role of an idiot and feel sorry for Raskolnikov's and old ladies whispering to their own ears sweet fairy tales about their uniqueness. But murdering with an axe sounds so unique that it deserved to be included in the novel. Lily Bunny is a positive hero and does not fight with axes. Then why should you give precious minutes of your priceless existence to the reading of my book? Because the efforts of your teacher shouldn't go in vain. Your English teacher, some Mrs. Watson, didn't sleep at night reviewing your English papers. You are indeed the last generation that can still read. I do not mean inscriptions and graffiti on the walls. I mean text longer than a parking ticket. Anyway, God forgot to give us instructions on how we are supposed to use ourselves, so we can be excused, at least, for reading those. Lily Bunny might be you, but without the dog-eat-dog -dog life, work that sucks, shrimpy wage, abuse and discrimination, burnt porridge, rubber love, clay conscience, spat soul, snotty childhood, wooden toys, finger in the glass of milk in kindergarten so that the neighbor would not drink it, blots in your copybook, ice cream fallen to the pavement, slaps of bully schoolmates, Jules Verne ships that set sail without you, pathetic marriage or pressure of certain circumstances that become fully grown boneheads who smoke in your basement, not just tobacco, dysfunctional family, disrespectful grandchildren, measly old age, early death, solitude in the crowd, and also, of course, the major disappointment of your entire life, whatsoever you choose it to be, and other insignificant troubles. Lily Bunny might be you, if, of course, you add to your life a full scoop of sunny days, some semolina porridge and raspberry jam, a friendship with a teddy bear, some common sense, some sense of humor, some sharp-toothed satire, some merry laughter, 
some unrestrained laughter, with hands swinging and feet stamping on the floor. Ha, ha, ha. Chapter 1. Lily Bunny's Furry Slippers Lily Bunny was famous for his furry blue slippers. First, Lily Bunny met his right slipper. It hopped along the road, singing a slippery song. Lily Bunny liked this funny guy, and so gave him a cookie. Lily Bunny always carried one in his pocket, just in case something like this should happen. So, right slipper followed Lily Bunny home and settled under Lily Bunny's bed. Then it came out that right slipper had a left brother. However, left's left foot's views were too liberal for everyone's taste, which made it impossible for a respectable right slipper to introduce his brother to Lily Bunny. But at five o'clock tea, Lily Bunny showed his political indifference. He offered raspberry jam to those who sat to his right side and those on his left, without any discrimination. Moreover, he even sent some jam to Hamster Hamlet, an insignificant inhabitant of his house, who lived in the basement near the furnace and didn't care to show up for tea. Seeing such a pluralistic approach in Lily Bunny's behavior, Right Slipper found the courage to introduce his left brother, in spite of the leftist slogans left was apt to spout. Distribute the wealth! Overthrow the government, reduce gas prices, turn off the light, and even death to global warming. Left Slipper was invited to join the very next tea party, where he was pleased to make acquaintances with the merry company which lived in Lily Bunny's cozy brick house. Lily Bear, Lily Kitty, and Lily Jake. Two cats, Lily Bunny usually carried an armful of cats, even though he had only two of them. His were pretty fat, or to be more exact, fat and pretty. Two quite articulate little parrots with well-developed two- to three-word vocabularies, with which they could fully enjoy their freedom of speech, and Hamster Hamlet, who has already been introduced to my honorable reader. However, Hamster Hamlet soon departed from Lily Bunny's house, because it turned out that he had solved the popular question, to be or not to be, in the most irresponsible way, amorally engaging himself in random relationships with numerous mice in the house. Very soon, Lily Bunny started to notice the seemingly inexplicable appearance of mutant mice offspring with hamster ears and mouse tails in his house. Such an impact on the course of evolution quite upset Hamster Hamlet himself, in such an unfortunate way that he placed the following ad in the local newspaper. Hamster Hamlet, way cuter than average, looking for a new apartment, won't accept any offers from mutant mice, and the telephone number. Hamster Hamlet had a telephone line of his own. He, frankly speaking, was a hamster individualist. I am sorry, but Hamster Hamlet did not give me his consent to disclose here his number, because he doesn't want to be disturbed during his winter hibernation that usually starts in mid-August and ends in mid-June. Though, in case of some sort of emergency, you may find it in the phone book under his name. But don't look under the section Rodents. You must look under Princes of Denmark. After acquiring such politically engaged slippers, Lily Bunny ceased to express any interest in politics. But it often occurred that Lily Bunny fell asleep while watching TV, putting his slippered feet right in front of the screen. While Lily Bunny took his nap, the slippers attentively watched all available political commentary and quietly discussed the current political climate. Climate is very important because if it changes, some politicians will start sneezing and coughing and might even need warmer cover-ups to cover their political ass. Yep, you got me right. I was going to say assets. Sometimes the slippers even debated different changes in the political system. You probably know that not all changes in the system are healthy. For example, changes in the gastrointestinal or cardiovascular system can turn deadly. Some democratic changes in the political system might be good for democracy itself, while changes in the systems of internal organs usually are considered a disturbing sign. Democracy between the systems of body organs may lead to some undesirable consequences if it gets too far. Imagine that your liver passes a no-confidence vote against your head. Or, excuse the medical details, your rectum impeaches your dignity. Sorry, dignity is not an internal organ. Sometimes it is. But debates among the elective organs are a good thing, for this means democracy is on the move. Democracy needs more physical activity. Otherwise, it gets obese and finishes up all the food in the nation's fridge. But democracy shouldn't move too fast, because it is not very young anymore, and its constitution sweats if it gets too heated. 
Then the world's tyrannies declare with disgust that democracy has got its constitution sweaty. Democracy promptly checks on its constitution and honestly confirms, yes, it is pretty wet, but this is repairable. But look at you, bloody tyrants. You keep your constitution dry, and it is entirely eaten up by moles. Then tyranny and democracy jump on each other and have a fight, and the rest of the world yawns while watching it on TV. I always supported democracy and the ultimate authority of the majority in theory, though I never got a practical answer to what should be done if the majority is evil or gets things wrong. Perhaps democracy has some mysterious power to improve human nature, otherwise wild and brutal, and which only gets worse in a crowd. Probably I am wrong and democracy has never turned bad, or if it has, people try to forget such unfortunate occurrences. Let us forget it too, for it is better to forget unsolvable questions than try to solve them. The only problem with the politically engaged slippers popped up when Lily Bunny woke up and went to the bathroom. He was very sleepy, and by mistake put the right slipper on his left foot and the left slipper on his right. This forced the slippers to change their political orientations almost immediately. This occurs fairly often in politics, but was tough for the slippers because they retained shreds of dignity. Which isn't quite true of politicians. To remain consistent in such confusion, the left slipper argued that he had gone so far to the left that for the first time in his life he had actually got things right, and the right slipper tried to convince himself and the others that since he had now traveled so far to the left, he had to adopt some leftist tactics. Don't get heated, my dearest reader. This is a simple truth of political life. Changing one's mind constantly is just one of the professional hazards of any political career. But Lily Bunny was sleeping and not paying attention to all these political acrobatics. Once he slept so deeply that he flipped over in his armchair. Thus he pointed his slippers up at the ceiling. That was the real moment of national unity. By raising both up, Lily Bunny won the hearts of his slippers. They agreed to elect Lily Bunny as president. They cast their ballots that way because first Lily Bunny treated everybody to raspberry jam, which made him very important, and second, he sometimes threw the slippers at his cats when they got too playful, and who, if not a real president, would do such a drastic thing in order to restore public order. You know, excessive playfulness might interfere with healthy sleeping, and this is unacceptable. Never wake society while it is sleeping. This may have serious consequences, especially to the one who wakes it up. And third, Lily Bunny was the owner of the house, and who, if not the owner, is supposed to be elected president. I mean, he owns the house. It is very important for democracy to confirm the real situation of society by electing the one who would rule anyway, even though he wasn't elected. This practice adds more legitimacy to the government, and therefore makes the loyal citizens feel better. Isn't that what modern democracy is all about? The slippers didn't tell Lily Bunny about their decision, because they were afraid the knowledge would make him nervous and preoccupied with his new political career. The slippers knew such preoccupation could seriously damage not only the household of the politician himself, but also households of many fellow citizens. Nor did the slippers tell anyone else in the house about electing Lily Bunny for the office. The other inhabitants seemed not to care. But that was just okay, because in a normal society, politics shouldn't much interfere with household issues. Now the slippers formed a coalition and began to run against Lily Bunny's winter boots, which would compete with the slippers for the leader's feet in December, or even as early as mid-November, if it snowed early that year. Chapter 2. Lily Bunny and Lily Bear Lily Bunny was always looking for a real friend, and finally he found him. This was Lily Bear. Lily Bear was a kind of teddy bear, but even more educated and polite. You might say that Lily Bears are not very talkative and tend to fall on one side. This is true. This lily bear also always fell on his side, trying to fit himself to benches, sofas, armchairs, or, generally speaking, to everything it was possible to lie down on with a reasonable degree of comfort and peace. But one couldn't call him not talkative or untalkable. That just was not true. He kept silence here and there, now and then. But all of a sudden he'd start talking, and God witness it wasn't easy to make him mute. At such moments, Lily Bear tried to say everything all at once, and one would think he heard a chorus of Lily Bears. So far, conventional science hasn't found any reasonable explanation of how it is possible for one Lily Bear to sound like many, 
though this is not the only thing conventional science finds difficult to explain. Lily Bear talked especially much if he sat on something wet. It also occurred in the pond or the bath. Then he became so chatty one could make friends with him as much as one wished. That's why Lily Bear avoided towels after a bath. He didn't want to lose his capability to complete the sentences that he might start once he was wet. I must say, it was even worse when Lily Bear sat on something cold, like a bench lightly frosted with snow. Then he could go so far as to write verses of songs. Here is one such song. Lily Bear wrote it for Lily Bunny with help from all the fellow inhabitants of the Lily Bunny house. We love Lily Bunny and both of his slippers, and this nice household that we gladly possess, because Lily Bunny is the one who can feed us, two parrots and an armful of cats. He always works hard, but he never gets tired. He shoots any trouble once and for all. You can't find a person who's equally kind. Such goodness may save our world. Keep walking with courage in your furry slippers, and always with an armful of your stupid cats. We cannot express our love any deeper. We love you as much as it possibly gets. Wow, Lily Bear said to himself. He always was saying wow to himself, just to make himself feel better but he didn't say wow with an exclamation mark, as everybody else does. He said it with a period in the end, like this, wow. Lily Bear was confident that wow with a period on the end sounded more convincing. When Lily Bear read the poem to the fellow inhabitants of Lily Bunny's house, they made pale efforts in the beginning to applaud him, but these efforts were too hopeless to be persisted in. The inhabitants of Lily Bunny house didn't know many languages, only Lily Bunny clapped his hands loudly and kissed Lily Bear on the nose. Lily Bunny loved his friend because only a real friend can write you a poem in three languages he doesn't quite know. The truth is, you don't have to know a language in order to use it. There are so many ways to express yourself without employing any language at all. Lily Bear had many other things that could do the same trick. Giggling, clapping, coughing, sneezing, yawning, and even farting. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't supposed to say that. But too late. Lily Bunny's left slipper likes to look over my shoulder at what I am writing, and when he saw the word farting, he went crazy, proclaiming a new slogan, Freedom of farting, freedom of farting. I didn't have much way to stop him. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, how could I use such a vulgar slang in my noble piece of writing? Well, there's still hope that the editor will delete the whole passage. You know, deleting is much more creative than writing because when you write, you don't have much choice what to write. You're just expressing your heart, exactly as Lily Bear did. But when someone has the power to delete, oh, that is a hell of a power. One might say that deleting is, in a way, more influential than writing. So if you can still read all this, blame the editor, not me. After so much linguistic effort from Lily Bear, how could Lily Bunny not consider him a best friend? He even gave Lily Bear a present, a ring, a cute little ringlet with writing on its inside. For love and friendship. Lily Bear was so happy he put two sticks in the ground in his backyard and started to throw the ring, trying to get it on a stick. He labeled one stick Luff, and on the other he wrote Friend Sheep, Lily Bear's way of spelling the words love and friendship. As a direct descendant of the Honorable Winnie the Pooh, and like all his descendants, Lily Bear suffered from slight difficulties in spelling. Once I thought that spelling would die out by the next generation, but computers saved it with their check spelling option. Now we don't have to remember the exact spelling, even of simple words, to get them right and be considered a well-educated person. Shakespeare didn't have such a luxury, poor thing. Once a computer does the spelling for me, I can allow myself to become a strong supporter of the conventional way of spelling. Can you possibly imagine how many generations of teachers kicks and slaps the word enough carries on its bloody letters? Regretfully, teachers don't beat up their students anymore. They found more elaborate ways to humiliate their students. We must admit that this constitutes substantial progress in the educational system, but it doesn't make the word enough any less bloody. Its old Germanic origin caused a lot of damage to young souls in their unhappy years of schooling maybe even more damage than the German military machine did to Great Britain and the English-speaking world. Well, I guess we had enough with the word enough. We must let it rest in peace. So Lily Bear always followed Lily Bunny and tried to fit himself on anything it was possible to lie down on. Lily Bunny kept telling Lily Bear, you lay around too long, or you sit too long. But Lily Bear didn't argue. He always agreed, saying, 
right, and then staying where he lay. When Lily Bunny baked pancakes for him, Lily Bear would lie down on a small, gauzy bench that Lily Bunny put in the kitchen for him. When the pancakes were ready, Lily Bear always started to philosophize. So specialists promptly dubbed this sort of philosophy, kitchen philosophy. Lily Bear's Kitchen Philosophy 1. Pancakes are better than buns. 2. Pancakes are better than buns particularly because I ate all the buns yesterday and I'm eating pancakes today. If I eat waffles, that means that they exist, whatever Descartes has to say. I think, therefore, I exist. Not true. Waffles do not need to think in order to exist. 3. Nietzsche is an idiot. That's it. Lily Bear, of course, had new thoughts sometimes, especially if he was given semolina porridge with raspberry jam, but these thoughts were so short that Lily Bear wrote them with his spoon directly on the porridge, and porridge is not a very reliable material for preserving eternal ideas. So humanity shall have to be satisfied with the three lines of Lily Bear's kitchen philosophy that we have already respectfully presented. Chapter 3. Lily Bunny's Golf in our day, nothing can be done in the business world if you don't play golf. Lily Bunny was not a businessman, but wanted to keep up with the times. He decided to take up this noble pastime, but didn't quite know how. So Lily Bunny examined pictures in a book about rich people and noted the things required for the game of golf. Special sticks and little balls. Larger than pigeon eggs, but smaller than chicken eggs. The main thing, of course, is a rich partner a gentleman with a cigar and a very cynical appearance. A green lawn with small holes is necessary as well. Lily Bunny decided to begin with the lawn, but the lawn in Lily Bunny's backyard was a torn-up mess of dirt and uprooted grass eaten by moles. Lily Bunny decided to fight them, but the moles did not want to fight. They surrendered immediately, but did not cease to damage the lawn. So Lily Bunny put on his blue slippers and went to the mole supervisor. You think I made a mistake saying supervisor? Should I have said the Mole King? No, I said it correctly. Moles, in spite of their blindness, are very clear-sighted people. They knew from the newspapers thrown by tourists that, topside, it long ago fell out of fashion to be called a king. It is trendy now to be called a supervisor. Upon learning this, the Mole King appointed himself supervisor of the Mole country and removed the royal crown from his head. He placed it under the royal throne to be stored there until kings become fashionable again. Lily Bunny arrived at the court of the mole supervisor. He said in a strict tone of voice that if the moles continued to spoil the lawn, then he, Lily Bunny, would all at once cease to love them and call them cute and pretty. Their status in his classification of the animal world would fall from that of cute animals he liked a lot to the one he gave the mice, whom he didn't quite like because of their naked tails and high, impulsive unpredictability. When a mouse ran about the lily house, Lily Bunny always panicked and asked the cats to help him catch it, but the cats were too lazy to do their job. Each time Lily Bunny had to catch the mouse, put it in a jar, and drive at least three miles from the house, then he would release the mouse and give her a sandwich with caviar as compensation for the inconvenience. Each time, Mouse sold the caviar to the Russian mafia and peacefully returned to the house in a brand new Mercedes toy car. It was getting dark and raining, the air filling with the evening serenades of frogs, but Lily Bunny and the mole supervisor still sat on the hill and argued about Lily Bunny's lawn. Finally, they agreed that if Lily Bunny gave the supervisor of moles a pair of old sunglasses, the moles would cease to eat the lawn. Sunglasses were extremely necessary to mole supervisors, who wore them in order to look not blind among the blind. Who, seeing the mole in the sunglasses, would think him blind? Why, everyone simply thinks the gentleman is on vacation. To be considered not blind in a blind kingdom is an excellent way to maintain royal power and legitimacy of the leadership. The mighty of the mole kingdom base their great traditions on the ancient values of the mole kings, who never disgrace their beds with black eye bandages of the sort we steal from airplanes and put on before sleeping so the morning light does not bother our eyes, eyes that have seen so much. Thus, to be considered sighted among the blind, honored by national tradition, gives more than just the foundation for being called a supervisor or any new-fashioned word indicating royal power. President, Prime Minister, General Secretary. Lily Bunny gave the mole supervisor his old, but by mole standards, quite new-fashioned sunglasses. 
The mole supervisor of royal blood settled the glasses on, and all the other moles left to eat the lawns of the neighbors, whispering excitedly to one another of their super-sighted ruler, with whom they could proudly enter the third millennium, now that he had destroyed the discriminatory image of the blind mole. Moles are not blind. They simply do not stare too much. They dig and do their simple mole work, eating lawns. Never point your finger at someone for being blind. If you do, he will find the means to make you blind too. So, having effected by his sunglasses packed a full-scale revolution of mole public self-image, Lily Bunny went to buy a golf stick and a set of little white balls. As it differed slightly from conventional golf, the game he played was named Lily Bunny's Golf. It is similar to conventional golf, but prior to the beginning of each game, it is compulsory to produce a full-scale revolution of public self-image in some society of the blind. In the Mole Society, there appeared the ruling party, Sighted Moles. They can, in truth, see as well as you see in darkness. Lily Bunny's golf doesn't include a cynical partner with a cigar, though. Chapter 4. Lily Bunny and the Fox One day, a fox entered Lily Bunny's backyard. As the fox was very skinny, Lily Bunny first thought the animal was a dog. Lily Bunny liked dogs, well-bred dogs, stray dogs, large dogs, small dogs, and even Baskerville dogs. He stepped forward to pet this one. But as Lily Bunny quickly saw, it wasn't a dog. It was a fox, and Lily Bunny didn't exactly like foxes. He didn't like their attitudes, their immoral behavior, and the fact that they resembled politicians and corporate executives, who, as everyone knows, are cut from the same dough. The fox that intruded into Lily Bunny's backyard was very pushy, and gave one the impression that he was going to settle. This monster put his ugly tail between the iron fence pickets and began to sniff around, especially where Lily Bunny and his cats used to sit near the fire and sing funny songs just to cheer themselves through the long nights. Lily Bunny got very angry and tried to shoot the fox with the mop that happened to be in his hands. But the fox paid no attention to Lily Bunny's attempts. Then Lily Bunny got his fox fur coat from the closet and waved it like a flag in front of the fox's nose. Lily Bunny hoped in this way he could show his unfriendly intentions towards this particular fox and foxes in general. In our day, it is not a big deal for a middle-class bunny to have a fox fur coat, and no fox can really feel safe anymore, because our generation is the first to live not only in a dog-eat-dog society, but also in a bunny-eat-fox society, and even a nobody-cares-who-is-eating-whom society. The fox paid no attention, though. It continued to sniff the empty bowl where the porridge had been, the bowl Lily Bear used when he relaxed in the pond in Lily Bunny's backyard. Lily Bear liked to sit in this pond as millionaires sit in their swimming pools, but instead of martinis with olives, he liked to have thick porridge with cinnamon, which Lily Bunny usually cooked for him and served to him in the pond. Lily Bunny guessed the fox might be rabid. To rule out this worrying possibility, he asked the fox specific questions about the government, voting rights, and the political situation in the country where they both resided. The fox did not answer, so Lily Bunny concluded the fox was not rabid. Lily Bunny took his fox fur coat back to the closet and complained to his cats about the fox's irritating behavior. The cats immediately implemented their Plan B. They went to their litter boxes and dropped their dirty bombs, which left very slight chance of the intruder's survival. Lily Bunny was counting on the fact that Lily Bear always left his huge towel with a picture of a leopard out. He never used the towels after bathing, but Lily Bunny always put a fresh one out anyway, in case Lily Bear ever needed to employ the stop-thinking tactics used in modern psychology. Lily Bunny thought that if the fox saw the picture of the leopard and smelled the presence of large cats in the vicinity, it might make her leave. Alas, it didn't work out this way. The fox put on her gas mask and continued exploring Lily Bunny's backyard. This is war, thought Lily Bunny. He ran inside the house and found his old Boy Scout bugle and began bugling. The fox took out her notebook and began to map the battlefield. Then Lily Bunny took his firecrackers, sneaked up to the fox while she was focused on mapping, and lit one off right next to the fox's ear. Later, in her memoir, My Military Career, the fox admitted that Lily Bunny's actions stunned her. She experienced slight deafness for the rest of her life, especially when her fellow foxes asked to borrow money. At the moment, though, the fox showed no sign of confusion. Lily Bunny declared a ceasefire and issued an ultimatum. 
that if the fox would not cease and desist all military actions and leave Lily Bunny's yard immediately, Lily Bunny would unilaterally cease his own military activities and go to sleep. The fox could continue sitting in the backyard until morning, when the dew on the leaves would make the fox get her paws and tail wet, and she probably would end up with rheumatism. Can you imagine a fox with rheumatism? They need to chase hares, stupid jumpy creatures that foxes feed on between elections and annual shareholders' meetings. But you can't chase a hare while suffering from rheumatism, can you? The fox left immediately. Who's to say that peace negotiations aren't efficient? You just need to add some peaceful threats to the talks. Then you will get favorable results. Chapter 5. Lily Bunny and His Mailbox Lily Bunny once had a small, plain mailbox, which stood near the road. It was dark green. Lily Bunny loved his mailbox, but one winter an evil tractor broke it down. Lily Bunny bought himself a huge, new mailbox, painted it Bordeaux red, and wrote on it, Lily Bunny. The post that held the mailbox Lily Bunny painted like a national border post, with red and white inclined strips. Traffic began to stop in front of it. The passengers getting out to show Lily Bunny their documents because they thought the post marked a national border. For Lily Bunny, it was necessary to hang an enormous poster. Pass, this is not a border. But since the traffic on the road passing Lily House was two-way, Lily Bunny added on the reverse side of the poster, You pass too. This is also not a border. Please don't take your pants off. People of Earth are so used to the fact that a national border can be drawn in any place that when they see any striped post, they obediently grab their documents and stand ready to take their pants off for the more thorough checking used to make sure no one transports anything forbidden beyond the limits of the striped post. Before the post, these things are allowed, and after it are not. If you try to cross with some anyway, you will end up in prison. People do not like going to prison, and so they, as one, arrange themselves in lines with their pants down before any striped post. Once the extraterrestrials from the planet Buzon decided to take over the Earth, but then saw with their extraterrestrial telescopes all the people of Earth standing in line before striped posts with their pants down, the Buzonians, thinking this might be contagious, took over another planet, leaving Earth to the crazy Earthlings. And we continued to establish new boundaries and borders, and the lines of people with their pants down grew and multiplied. Do not trespass became a world slogan. This is important. It must be done to maintain order. If we do not hold a large part of our humanity in lines with their pants down, how can we ensure world peace? No one was surprised to see Lily Bunny's border post, because most citizens are loyal and obedient. Voluntarily, they forewent their suspenders to be better ready to support national security by stripping off their pants before the striped post. Lily Bunny's explanatory poster practically solved the problem, but it was still necessary once or twice a day to stretch the pants taken by mistake of passing drivers with weak sight or poor knowledge of letters. Knowledge of all the letters of the alphabet considerably facilitates reading. It is possible, of course, to read without knowing all the letters. It is simple to turn over the pages of the book, search for familiar letters, and read only them. But looking for letters such as B or U in some books will cause the meaning to slip off the reader. Therefore, our schools attempt to train people to read most of the letters although some present difficulty. Since well-developed modern school systems ensure that the majority of population had knowledge of the alphabet, people began to write each other letters, and the postal service was born to transport them. Indeed, writing letters to send abroad is much easier than standing in line for two hours at the airport with your pants down, and then another two hours on your way back, all the while risking prison if you do something illegal like carry manicure scissors. We understand that the war on terrorism is more important than nail care, but try explaining that to women. Lily Bunny didn't like to travel abroad, and therefore always made sure his mailbox was ready to accept new letters. Surprisingly, the way the exterior of your mailbox looks greatly influences what messages you receive. When Lily Bunny's mailbox was green, all the letters he got were as melancholy as the green. But as soon as he put up the new Bordeaux red box, merriest on the entire road, he began to receive funny postcards from tropical countries, letters of congratulation with pictures of chamomile flowers, periodicals with jolly pictures, and candies from Santa Claus. Lily Bunny was as surprised as one can be that the color of the receiver's mailbox could influence the sender. Lily Bunny even wrote a letter describing this phenomenon to the esteemed physicist Super Einstein, 
who got drunk because of the insolvability of the paradox. Then, after being given a morning-after drink, a solution of fast neutrons, Super Einstein gave a name to the phenomenon, the Lily Einstein Super Bunny Paradox, and that is how it is entered in contemporary textbooks on quantum postal physics. However, as Lily Bunny did not rely solely on theoretical science, he sat down in the bushes next to the mailbox to see what really happened when the postman, Good Newsman, came. Mailbox was gladdened and began to lick the postman on his nose, wagging his post like a tail. Sit still, said the postman, but the box didn't calm down. It sniffed the postal bag, snatched out the merriest postcards, and swallowed them immediately. But the postman did not get angry at it. When Good Newsman left, Lily Bunny took his mailbox for a walk, built in a doghouse, and bought a doggy bone. Chapter 6 Lily Bunny and His Sponge Aristocratic title is no longer a tribute to origin and noble blood, but to a well-fed childhood and superb education. Now it is possible to meet aristocrats in any class of society, workers and peasants, sponges, tubes of toothpaste, manicure scissors, and especially, it goes without saying, powder cases. I personally had the honor to know a remarkable, exceptionally well-brought-up powder case, which until now lived in the secret two-room pocket of Lily Bunny's purse. She had not been used to powder noses for a long time, but had prepared herself exclusively for elegant conversations. Mademoiselle Powder Case was presented by Lily Bear as a good old friend of the family of his grandmother, who in turn was introduced to Mademoiselle Powder Case at the International Exhibition in Paris in 1937. But since then, lonely, unmarried, pretty, old Powder Case didn't feel quite comfortable living in young Lily Bear's toy box. It was just inconvenient. So Mademoiselle Powder Case happily consented to settle in the purse of Lily Bunny, where she found modest but convenient apartments. Lily Bunny's sponge was also aristocratic, Therefore, Lily Bunny wouldn't dare allow himself the insolence of using her services as an ordinary sponge. Lily Bunny soaped himself with Lily Bear's sponge because Lily Bear didn't need it anyway. He bathed in the pond and didn't use the sponge much. Even so, it is necessary to say that Lily Bear persistently asked Lily Bunny for that sponge, and even arranged a small demonstration of protest like those many brave people used to organize in front of the Kremlin in the communist days of Moscow. There are not many brave people who do this now. This signifies a real victory for freedom in Russia. The wall of Lily House was covered with Kremlin-style red bricks, so Lily Bear marched by it, waving a picket sign. A sponge for the bear! And loudly proclaiming his revolutionary slogan, A sponge for the bear! A sponge for the bear! Again and again. Moreover, he drawled out the word sponge so sorrowfully Sponge! That Lily Bunny took pity on him and purchased Lily Bear a sponge. Lily Bear immediately lost interest of any kind in it, and he bathed in the pond without it. So Lily Bunny had to employ this sponge in order to keep unemployment low in Lily House. As you remember, Lily Bunny was the lawfully elected president of Lily House, and he worried about its levels of unemployment. This could serve as a good example to other presidents. Worry about the levels of unemployment, and you don't have to worry about anything else. Unemployment is the new god of politicians. You may cheat, lie, steal, no one cares. But if unemployment goes up, you are politically dead. Because, as we once said, every healthy individual has to work. And it doesn't matter if he, she, it works as a sponge and cleans someone's, not important what, or soaps someone's, other very important things. Thus freed from her official responsibilities, the sponge of Lily Bunny delegated the duty of washing Lily Bunny to her younger colleague, the new sponge of Lily Bear, and occupied herself writing poetry. In the bath, warm steam, I forget my dream, I forget myself, and I lost my health. Mademoiselle Sponge centrally recited and looked out the window of the bathroom, smoking a long lady's cigarette in no less long amber mouthpiece. My soap thoughts, leave me alone. I spent my life washing someone's ears. I want to die. I want to sink in tears, and then my bones will see another world. Lily Bunny listened and sometimes asked provocative questions that would irritate any beginning poet, like, But, Mademoiselle Sponge, you don't have any bones. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. 
answered the depressed Mademoiselle Sponge. The melancholy of Mademoiselle Sponge grew each day. She sank in self-pity. She felt pulled down by an insurmountable force of uncompromising terrestrial gravity. She swelled in weight and twice fell to the floor with the hook on which she hung. Lily Bunny began to worry about Mademoiselle Sponge. He introduced her to a famous therapist and psychologist, the neo-freudophartist Dr. Coffinson, who preached the idea that it is not necessary to hold inside what is possible to let out. His books made much progress in this glorious new direction of psychology, neo-freudophartism. In the psychologist's office, Mademoiselle Sponge only moaned and released soap bubbles. Mr. Coffinson, cheerful because of his duty, proposed that Mademoiselle Sponge travel, but she objected in verse reckoning. Leave me alone, leave me alone. Mr. Coffinson's wife was the only travel agent in town, and for some inexplicable reason, all his patients needed to travel. They usually were told to buy a tour around the world as part of their therapy. Mrs. Coffinson always added to this all-inclusive package a substantially discounted detour to the moon, because Mr. Coffinson recommended to all his patients a visit to this heavenly body in order to enjoy the proven therapeutic effect of its particularly cheerful landscapes. Mademoiselle Sponge attempted to tell Mr. Coffinson about her dry, unhappy childhood in the store, in which she spent one and a half cheerless years without a droplet of soap, feeling rejected. However, Mr. Coffinson didn't want to hear about her childhood. He was a little disappointed that Mademoiselle Sponge didn't follow his advice to travel, so he proposed that Mademoiselle Sponge at least purchase his new book, Just Let It Out, which Mr. Coffinson, it is necessary to give credit, was selling to his patients not at all for the speculative price. Why are psychologists never quite satisfied with the money we pay for sessions? Why do they always try to sell us their books? Maybe because writers always try to sell us the psychological advice in their books. There is constant competition between psychologists and writers. Who will get our money? They are very dangerous people, psychologists and writers. Sometimes they are ambitious, greedy, and impulsive. Writers don't read. They always say, I am not a reader, I am a writer. Why should I read? And psychologists usually have messy personal lives. They say, why should anybody else be happy if I am not? You might say, you aren't a psychologist, but obviously you are a writer. Why are you saying such things? I don't know. Maybe because I am a good writer. Maybe because I am trying to be honest. I already know what I am going to buy with my Nobel Prize in literature. A new vacuum cleaner, even though this thing has a very deceitful name. A vacuum is empty space, right? So why would you need to clean a vacuum? You might ask, and why are you talking about vacuum cleaners? Well, if you are a good writer, you don't care what you say. Writers just say whatever comes to mind. Mademoiselle Sponge did not purchase the book, left the psychologist, and simply decided she was mortally sick and going to die soon. She'd seen the television show SpongeBob SquarePants, and so she knew that sponges are just like people. They have everything, the pants, the brains, and even the souls. Lily Bunny decided to distract Mademoiselle Sponge from her sad thoughts. He bought her flowers, but she tragically stated, Save these flowers for the funeral. I don't have children, so there won't be anybody else to put flowers on my grave. Lily Bunny decided that Mademoiselle Sponge was sad because she didn't have any kids. He bought her an animal friend so she would take care of it and forget her depression. It was a fly. This fly was a chubby little boy, but Mademoiselle Sponge didn't take care of him, and the chubby little boy grew up to be a garbage fly. He was not very clean, and finally he was sent away to a rehabilitative clinic after he was caught smoking green tea, a powerful and illegal aphrodisiac for flies. Thus Mademoiselle Sponge remained alone. Her poems became increasingly sad. There appeared headaches, she couldn't sleep, and she suffered from dryness. Oh, God! Mademoiselle Sponge began to fall to pieces. Dry winds of death, tear me apart. I won't be happy, I won't be happy. To make me wet, is that your art? Then make me soapy, for the last time, maybe. When Lily Bunny heard this poem, he started to cry and urgently soaped Mademoiselle Sponge. But Mademoiselle Sponge spat out the soap and shouted that she was not looking for earthly soap. She needed spiritual soap, and Lily Bunny didn't understand a thing in her poor Sponge's soul. Lily Bunny was frightened for Mademoiselle Sponge's health, so he helped her dress in her favorite veil made from toilet paper, without which she never left the bathroom, and quickly transported her to Dr. Diefast, 
who gave Mademoiselle Sponge a full sponge scan, FSS, after injecting contrast-enhancing shampoo into her main artery. Mademoiselle Sponge was diagnosed with acute generalized sponge melancholy, or AGSM, and chronic soap deficiency, or CSD, and forbidden to write verses. Mademoiselle Sponge immediately asked for the priest. Most people don't know it, but sponges are very religious. The fate of Mademoiselle Sponge was decided the morning of the following day, when she, after confessing one not very serious bath sin, prepared to leave this imperfect world for another one, where cleanliness is not a forced need, but an achieved fact. Fortunately, that same morning, Lily Bunny noticed that Lily Bear had lain around too long and become a bit stale. Lily Bear did not argue. He took his new sponge, which usually washed Lily Bunny, and started to bathe with it in the pond. Lily Bunny, having completely forgotten the terrifying situation his sponge was in, grabbed her sleeping from the hook, decisively soaped up, and used her according to her primary function, which was not poetry, but bathing. Surprisingly, Mademoiselle Sponge recovered immediately and was never sick again. Chapter 7 Lily Bunny and His Neurosis It was a dark, dark night in Lily Bunny's house. Everything was still and silent. Only the large grandfather clock didn't sleep. It slept in the daytime and walked around the house making noise at night. The cats snored in unison. Lily Bunny's left slipper slept restlessly, muttering, Distribute the wealth. Lily Bunny's old grandfather clock walked quietly along the house, occasionally savoring sour cream from Lily Bunny's fridge. Perhaps you do not know that all grandfather clocks need fresh dairy products? Without the creamy food, they begin to beat everyone they can reach with their pendulums. But with it, they behave calmly. Grandfather clocked, finished a sour cream, looked at the electronic display on the microwave which displayed the time, and cursed. It's so goddamn late. It's already twenty minutes after three, and I didn't chime even once. Damn old age. Tick-tack. Lily Bunny's clock was so old it couldn't count the time by itself anymore. The old clock despised the microwave's electronic clock, but constantly looked up at the time. Grandfather clock walked with its heavy gait to its place in the dining room, wiping his face clean of sour cream with a napkin. Boom! rang Lily Bunny's grandfather clock. It usually made its booms with no hurry. The intervals between the booms were sometimes so long that no one knew whether each boom related to the previous hour or the next. Grandfather clock listened to the silence, for its boom woke no one. Even skittish Beja didn't wake up, though she slept on the cover of the old grand piano that stood in the same room. The piano slept a peaceful sleep. It dreamed that Lily Bear finally learned his notes and began to play a tolerable rendition of Chopin's Nocturne, which the grand piano missed greatly, for no one had played that masterpiece on it for at least half a century. Lily Bear, for the most part, played works of his own composition, which always rolled to the well-known melody of the folk song Little Bear Has a Day Off. Clock, in a hurry, made two more booms and fell asleep after leaning on the wall having far-sightedly lowered both weights to the floor so Lily Bunny wouldn't complain the next day. Why does this clock never work in the day? It makes noise, thumps around, and eats all the sour cream and cottage cheese in the house at night. The house sunk into a deep silence, and only once was heard the cry of Lily Bear in his sleep. Land! He was dreaming, not for the first time, of a Jules Verne novel in which he was a sailor bear and traveled aboard a real ship. Suddenly, someone knocked at the door. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Lily Bunny awoke immediately. He wasn't surprised. In Lily House, it happened frequently that neighbors knocked at night, innocently asking to borrow some onion or that pair of sunglasses. Lily Bunny woke both his slippers because he did not want to walk through the entire house barefoot, took the onion bulb and sunglasses from the night table, and with no irritation murmured, Who the hell is knocking? Though he knew for sure it was his beloved neighbor, Mr. Squeezehard, who at night squeezed maple syrup from birch firewood after rubbing it with fresh onion for smothering. The sunglasses were necessary so that the onion would not make him cry. Mr. Squeezehard didn't like it when something or someone made him cry. He apparently preferred to make others cry. Except for this, he was a very pleasant gentleman in his early years of retirement. You thought Lily Bunny's neighbor was some sort of retarded person awaiting hospitalization in a certain sort of facility? Now see how wrong you were. 
Now you see that the man was making a worthy business and not just fooling around, as most of us do most of the time. Don't make premature conclusions. Don't giggle and say, Why, for Pete's sake, would the neighbor need sunglasses at night? This is pathetic. You are pathetic yourself if you rush to premature conclusions. It is necessary to respect one's labor, especially when it is promptly rewarded by a small jar of superb maple syrup, which the grateful neighbor usually brought as an almost free gift and token of his friendship. Lily Bunny treated his lily bear to the maple syrup and disregarded the small nighttime inconveniences. My honorable reader, please don't start again, saying, Holy smokes, what are you talking about? You cannot squeeze maple syrup out of birch firewood. Maybe you will also say that the grandfather clock does not eat sour cream. Then please, simply close the book, because now begins the most interesting and unbelievable part of the tale. Did I say everything in this book is based on real stories? Real stories are usually the most unbelievable ones. Lily Bunny, with the onion bulb and the sunglasses in his hands, unlocked his front door. On the threshold stood Lily Bunny's neurosis. Did you turn off the teapot? it asked anxiously. Yes, I did, said Lily Bunny, and shut his door. After leaving the sunglasses and onion bulb close to the front door, just in case, Mr. Squeezehard did come that night. Lily Bunny went to his bedroom. He passed through the kitchen to check on the teapot anyway. Barely had Lily Bunny shut his eyes when the knock on the front door was heard again. Now whoever it was knocked differently, very persistently and nervously. Lily Bunny jumped out of bed thinking, probably Mr. Bolthead. This neighbor frequently asked Lily Bunny for bolts, always at night. Mr. Bolthead habitually did his work with bolts at night, so as not to draw unnecessary attention from the local community, which did not like people trying to attract attention to anything. Lily Bunny took a bag of bolts and ran down the stairs to open the door. On the threshold stood Lily Bunny's neurosis. "'Will you excuse me, Monsieur Lily Bunny?' it said very politely, intelligently putting an emphasis on the last syllable of Lily Bunny's name in the French style. However, it had difficulty controlling its agitation. Did you cover your flowers? They can dry up during the night. No, they will not dry up. At night the sun does not shine, said Lily Bunny, ready to shut the door again. And what if a supernova flares up? Lily Bunny's neurosis asked restlessly. Lily Bunny thought for a moment and opened the door. He knew from Lily Bear that when a supernova goes off, the flowers must be covered with cloth to protect them from the harsh radiation. Lily Bunny politely shook hands with his neurosis, and they went to the backyard to cover the flowers with a piece of cloth. After completing this elaborate procedure, they said good night to each other, and Lily Bunny returned to his bed. While falling asleep, Lily Bunny sorted out in his head, with satisfaction, the turned-off teapot and sheltered flowers. He heard the knock at his door again. The visitor knocked so loudly, Lily Bunny fell off his bed. After a few moments, short of breath, he forewent his slippers and ran down, trying not to panic, and opened the door. Once again, his neurosis stood in the doorway. Its hair was tattered, and its small, unhappy eyes shone feverishly in the darkness. "'You forgot your wallet at the market!' Lily Bunny's neurosis nearly yelled. Lily Bunny, without thinking or checking this extraordinary claim, jumped into his car, and they drove to the market. They didn't find the wallet at the market. There were only the mountains of empty shells of the nuts the global economy ate by mistake after her morning conversation with Lily Bunny. Lily Bunny returned home, where he found his wallet on the dresser. Lily Bunny's neurosis politely apologized and respectfully left the house, promising not to bother Lily Bunny any more. Lily Bunny returned to bed, firmly resolved not to wake up if his neurosis came back in spite of its kind promise. But as soon as Lily Bunny wrapped himself sweetly in his blanket, someone began to scratch at his window. Lily Bunny thought one of his cats had slipped out when he drove to look for his wallet at the market. Now the hungry fox could eat his cat. Lily Bunny, in horror, ran up to the window and opened it. He called the cat, but it was his neurosis's muzzle pressed to the window. Did you feed the hamster? It trembled. The hamster moved out long ago, answered Lily Bunny impatiently, and slammed shut the window. And yet he ran down the stairs to leave a note. Food in the fridge, just in case Hamster Hamlet unexpectedly came back. Then Lily Bunny once more tried to sleep. His peace was short-lived, for in the chimney of Lily House something rustled. Lily Bunny opened the damper, and the neurosis fell out of the fireplace. Listen up, said Lily Bunny's neurosis restlessly. Don't you think it smells like carbon monoxide in the air? 
Willy Bunny was a well-educated bunny and knew that carbon monoxide does not have any smell, but sampled the air with his nose nevertheless. No, it does not smell, he said nervously, then pushed his neurosis back up the chimney flue and shut the damper. Lily Bunny decided to go to the bathroom, thinking he had little chance this night of sleeping at all. On his way to the toilet, he opened all the windows in the house just in case the neurosis was right about the carbon monoxide. It was summer, of course, and no one had used the fireplace for three months, but we should all be careful. In the bathroom, Lily Bunny raised the cover of the toilet. There in the bowl sat his neurosis. Why did you open all the windows? yelled Lily Bunny's neurosis. Your Lily Bear will catch cold. Lily Bunny slammed the toilet shut and broke into a run to shut the windows. But at the first window sat Lily Bunny's neurosis, thoroughly wet after its time in the toilet, so it was necessary to wipe the neurosis dry and warm it up with hot tea and raspberries. Lily Bunny's neurosis continued to shake, and through the knocking of its teeth asked, And what if your ceiling crumbled? Lily Bunny broke into a run and placed supports under his ceiling. And what if a meteorite suddenly fell? Lily Bunny climbed on the roof and tied pillows to the tiles to soften an impact. And if... and... uh... They rushed about until morning. The following night, Lily Bunny's neurosis took some sleeping pills and wrapped itself comfortably in its bedspread. Lily Bunny's neurosis lived in the small hollow of the old oak growing in Lily Bunny's backyard. Lily Bunny's neurosis locked the door of its hollow for the night, just in case. It decided not to go anywhere this night. Someone knocked at the door. It was Lily Bunny. Listen up, did you turn off the teapot? He asked restlessly. Lily Bunny's neurosis embraced Lily Bunny and said, Welcome to the club. And they checked on the teapot together, and then had tea with sleeping pills. Lily Bunny's neurosis spent the night in the basket of Golden Cat, who never used it because he slept everywhere in the house. Since then, Lily Bunny always lulled his neurosis at bedtime. He gave it warm milk with honey to drink and went to bed only after it was asleep. They no longer ran around the house at night. But in the hollow of Lily Bunny's oak tree settled another tenant, the neurosis of Mr. Squeezehard, who one night squeezed the last drop from his birch firewood, reducing his neurosis to complete nervous exhaustion. Chapter 8 Lily Bunny and His Lawyer one evening, Lily Bunny was so tired, he ran up the stairs to his bedroom as fast as he could. He had just made an appointment with one Mr. Troublesen, who had promised to get him out of trouble. Mr. Troublesen had a solid legal practice in a nearby town. Lily Bunny's trouble had its birth in a decision made by the government in 1882, declaring that the state could build a road through Lily Bunny's land, most of which was occupied by his backyard. Therefore, the mayor had lawful right of way, free passage through the backyard at any time. Yet this wasn't the start of the trouble. All the years that Lily Bunny lived in his house, the formality had never disturbed him, or any other inhabitant of Lily House. Each time the mayor passed through, Lily Bunny locked his cats inside the house so they would not run under the wheels of the mayor's convoy. Lily Bunny also put his mailbox on the short chain so it would not chase the six horses pulling the mayor's coach. And each time the entourage passed, Lily Bear took his dearly loved national flag, which kept coming down ill and unknotted the unbelievable knots flag tied itself in because of it necessary to remove the flag from display without jeopardizing the dignity of the state. Then Lily Bear would swing the flag from the window and solemnly sing the national song, especially loudly when the mayor's crew, after catching the wheels of the coach in the mud, hefted it on their shoulders, and with disgust, stepping over the brown water, barefooted, transported his honor across the Atlantic Ocean, the enormous puddle in Lily Bunny's driveway. Lily Bear godlessly confused several words of the national song, but the mayor smiled at him. Lily Bunny's problem began when his honor, the mayor, delegated to his representative the duty of crossing Lily Bunny's property. This representative habitually took with him many assistants, who smoked and littered Lily Bunny's property with cigarette butts. Flag was so dissatisfied it tied itself up in triple knots and could not be hung out. Lily Bear tried several times to sing, Welcome, Representative of the Mayor, but the surname of this official rhymed badly with the remaining text of the national song. The day Lily Bunny was so tired that he broke into a run to reach his bed, he had removed cigarette butts from the tracks of the representative of the mayor. Therefore, Lily Bear made an appointment with Mr. Troublesome to have the right-of-way clause deleted 
from the deed of Lily House. Why, the road had been built 100 years ago, 15 kilometers to the south of Lily Bunny's property. There was no need to litter Lily Bunny's driveway and backyard with cigarette butts. Flag completely agreed with Lily Bunny's decision and explained to its neighbors in the closet, unpatriotic mops, that there was no reason to hang itself out, except in the presence of his honor, the mayor himself. And the mops laughed at the flag because they greatly envied their noble relative. The following morning, Lily Bunny put on the business suit, which consisted of a black T-shirt with the inscription, I'm busy. He put on the second piece of his business suit, his black sports shorts, and left to see his lawyer. The lawyer, Mr. Troublesome, met Lily Bunny at his office and said right away that this was not a simple issue. He talked for two hours about the history of the question, but never touched on the question itself. This is the way all lawyers are trained to talk, to win in court. You win a case only if you put everyone in the courthouse asleep with your monologue. So this way of talking became a professional disease of all lawyers. When a lawyer's wife asks him whether he wants tea or coffee, he starts with the history of the question and never gives a definite answer. Though we must admit that no lawyer that has mastered such a way of talking can be held responsible for anything because he never says or does a thing and therefore can be excused from any responsibility whatsoever. Lily Bunny listened patiently, but in the end he asked, So how can we solve the problem? Well, it is possible, but there is one small obstacle, said Mr. Troublesome. This is good. A small obstacle is not a problem. So what should be done? asked Lily Bunny enthusiastically. It is simple. You need make some slight adjustments on your property before we can file the request for deletion of the right of passage, said Mr. Troublesome. No problem. What are they? asked Lily Bunny. Actually, there is only one change that must be done. Speaking more precisely, added Mr. Troublesome, after checking some book of laws. And this change is, asked Lily Bunny slightly impatiently, to destroy your house. Mr. Troublesome completed the sentence and went on with his polite explanation. In fact, according to regulations dated 1892, in order to delete the right of way, right to passage, from the title, the applicant should present a proof that the land in question is free of any buildings, sheds, or other structures. Why such a regulation emerged in the first place is hidden in the obscurity of old times. But please don't worry, Mr. Lilybunny. This is standard procedure, and I recommend you carry it out without further delay, because the period of service of the current representative of his honor, the mayor, ends this Friday. And according to reliable information from the mayor's inner circles, he is going to appoint Mr. Elephantson from planning. Elephantson and his crew usually trespass on my client's properties riding elephants, which have the habit of littering in a way that will make you recall the good old days when you only had to pick up cigarette butts. Modern society tends to put its members into completely hopeless situations. So it was in the case of Lily Bunny and his house. A stupid regulation written by some drunk or insane legislator over 100 years ago now placed poor Lily Bunny before an intolerable dilemma destroy his house, or spend his life removing elephant droppings from his backyard. Lily Bunny was a very reserved individual and didn't show much of his frustration. He just opened his mouth and started to shout very loudly, Ah, 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 Lily Bunny also tried to cover his mouth, eyes, and ears simultaneously, using only one pair of hands. Mr. Troublesome stared in awe, believing he saw the multi-armed god before him, then he knelt and read a prayer. In Mr. Troublesome's youth, he had gravitated to a foreign sect that taught him to worship this powerful and ancient god. As a matter of fact, it was there he had made acquaintance with Mr. Elephantson, a good friend of his up until now, who had served as Troublesome's source of information from the inner circles of his honor, the mayor. Lily Bunny continued to shout, and Mr. Troublesome amended his first impression with the following conclusion. Suppose this is not a multi-armed god. Mr. Troublesome rose from his knees and poured a glass of water to make Lily Bunny stop crying. Lily Bunny refused it and paid for the time Mr. Troublesome spent providing his valuable advice. Then Lily Bunny returned to his home, where he told all his inhabitants about the trouble that had popped up so unexpectedly. Before Lily Bunny left, Mr. Troublesome promised to visit Lily House to make sure everyone got his message right and to have dinner with the family. Mr. Troublesome liked to socialize with his clients especially when the clients were buying him lunch or dinner, because he honestly believed this made his services even more valuable. He was always ready to tell his clients the history of any question in such informal settings. 
Mr. Troubleson deeply believed that knowledge of the history of a question might easily substitute its resolution. Legal systems are never worried about fair results. They worry about procedure for the sake of procedure itself. Mr. Troubleson also wanted to use this opportunity to recommend the services of one of his relatives, who was a contractor, and could demolish the house and rebuild it for a very reasonable price. Do not overreact, dear reader. It would be most unjust to assume that Mr. Troubleson pursued any vicious purposes or interests when he himself recommended to his honor the mayor that his friend Mr. Elephantson be appointed to trespass on homeowners' properties. My honorable reader, why do you see a dirty scam in such a tiny coincidence? It doesn't matter that Mr. Troublesome knew Mr. Elephantson would trouble his clients, nor does it matter that he expected his clients to ask for his services to get them out of trouble or to buy the construction services of his relative. Of course, when you put it all together, it looks like Mr. Troublesome tried to cheat innocent homeowners of their money. This is just not true, because Mr. Troublesome was a true gentleman. He always helped the ladies put on their coats, even if they came without coats, a firm sign of his gentlemanly behavior. True gentlemen never pursue mercenary purposes. If it turns out that everything they do or make goes only to their benefit, I assure you it is pure coincidence. Mr. Troublesome joined Lily Bunny and his friends for dinner, and after finishing his pudding, Mr. Troublesome proposed to discuss the options. So, after dinner, all spoke about the problem of Lily House. Lily Bunny's right slipper proposed to untie the flag of Lily Bear and give it to Mr. Elephantson as a bribe, so that he would select smaller elephants and feed them little before bringing them to Lily Bunny's backyard. But left slipper said you couldn't bribe an official, at least not with a national flag. Then he proposed to untie the flag anyway and start a civil war for independence from elephants. Lily Kitty and Lily Jake proposed to sell the house and buy a new one somewhere on the seashore in a tropical country. The cats proposed to lie down to sleep while Mr. Elephantson passed by and make Lily Bunny's car clean up the mess. Lily Bunny's car proposed to leave the house while Mr. Elephantson passed by, go live in her garage, and later make the cats clean up the mess. Lily Bear kept silent and mysteriously smiled. On Friday, immediately after Mr. Elephantson's designation as the representative of the mayor, the above-mentioned honored gentleman promptly appeared in Lily Bunny's backyard with a whole bunch of elephants. But the moment the elephants stepped on Lily Bunny's land, they reared up on their back feet, turned and ran far away, taking Mr. Elephantson with them. Since then, neither Mr. Elephantson nor his elephants ever trespassed on Lily Bunny's backyard again. You might ask why. Immediately after the memorable dinner with Mr. Troublesome, Lily Bear called Hamster Hamlet, who brought many of his girlfriends, all mice, to Lily Bunny's backyard on Friday. Hamster Hamlet had as many mouse girlfriends as King Solomon had wives. Hundreds. Elephants are afraid of mice, as you probably know from the programs on National Geographic or the Discovery Channel. Chapter 9. Lily Bunny and Small Talk Conversations are tricky. Some like them, some don't. They live, usually in corridors, drawing rooms, kitchens, streetcars, cafes. Yes, where don't they live? There are sincere conversations, but they are encountered rarely and don't live long, usually one night, like some light-winged butterflies, and only come out when accompanied by nice hors d'oeuvres and equally nice drinks. Let's talk about small talk, because they usually are annoying, empty, and not very sophisticated. Small talks sometimes don't know for what purpose they exist, and tend to die prematurely, because a life without purpose is an unpleasant experience indeed. Did you ever try such? Try, you will see. But if you were born, it doesn't matter whether you have purpose in life or not. It doesn't matter whether you enjoy this life or not quite. You have to live, eat, drink, make love, and keep your mouth shut. This is a basic law of nature. If you are alive, be happy and don't complain. If you die, you may complain, but no one is sure whether it will be possible. So people complain while they are alive. Other people don't want to hear their complaints and therefore have created one of the greatest inventions of all time, small talk, the most vague and useless creature on earth. It teaches us how to talk and not share thoughts, information, or feelings of any kind. Of course, there are other sorts of conversations, such as business talks or erotic murmurs, but neither are quite welcome in nice company. One small talk jumped at Lily Bunny while he was walking down the street. It sang a song. 
Lily Bunny walking down the street. Lily Bunny doesn't eat the meat. You might say this is plagiarism and that the song was originally composed for Pretty Woman. Why does everyone get so excited about sweet tales concerning prostitutes? Why not Lily Bunnies? Another small talk hung itself on Lily Bunny's ear when he was in the grocery store. Yes, it hung itself on a length of ribbon, because like most aimless souls, small talks turn suicidal, and then the whole bunch of them pounced on Lily Bunny. One small talk, how do you like the weather today, bit Lily Bunny and stole the illustrated journal that Lily Bunny bought for Lily Bear. As he left the store, Lily Bunny took out his neurosis because he wanted to let it get some fresh air. This was foolish, for they both became victims of the whole pack of wolves. Oh, I am sorry, I was going to say a pack of small talks. Small talks often hang together in packs. Wild small talks are dangerous for young neuroses. Lily Bunny's neurosis got so frustrated it started to run in circles and even fell into the ditch. Lily Bunny helped his neurosis climb out and closed his ears with a scarf. He even had to buy his neurosis a huge chocolate bar to calm it down. You know that chocolate is the way to calm your neurosis and provoke your diabetes, destroying your teeth on the way? Medieval dentists invented chocolate in order to ensure their future income until the end of time. That's why I propose to call them medieval, because either they were medically evil, or because they brought me devil into my mouth, whose name it carries. Another small talk attacked Lily Bunny right at the place he was buying the chocolate for his neurosis. Are you ready for summer? It seemed to imply that if Lily Bunny was not ready for summer, he could call summer over the phone and ask it to come a little bit later. And it would wait because one Lily Bunny was not ready yet. The idiocy of small talks is obvious. They served seemingly as the cockroach mustaches of the inhabitants of Lily Bunny's town. The townspeople used this mustache of small talks, touching neighbors and pedestrians. If the newcomer answered with a proper small talk, their mustache, it meant, this one is local, we shouldn't eat him alive. But if they didn't get the right answer, it meant, oh my god, he is a stranger. And a stranger should always be eaten or somehow eliminated because otherwise he will eat or eliminate you. Small talk must be an ancient tradition. It is as primitive as one-celled organisms. Once Lily Jake saw, under his microscope, two one-cell organisms engaged in small talk. One of them asked, how's your mitosis going? It's okay, thanks, the other answered and they both duplicated. What boring lives one-cell organisms have. They don't employ sex as a means of reproduction. Well, lately we quite often don't employ sex exactly as a meaning of reproduction either, but for other obscure reasons. Does this bring us to the level of one-celled organisms? Apparently, sometimes, it does. Lily Bunny farmed for a living, so he couldn't afford to keep his small talks on his farm, because they ate much, but nothing useful came out of them. They were not like chickens, which you can feed and then get fresh eggs in exchange. Small talks are like viruses that reproduce themselves, maliciously using our heads as their hosts. After invasion by small talk, one's head drains till it's as empty as an empty pan, and emptiness is little step toward the non-existence we call the disturbing and unpleasant word, death. Small talks so scared Lily Bunny's neurosis that Lily Bunny had to take him home early. Lily Bunny's neurosis ran into the house and bumped into Lily Bear's neurosis. Then he squeezed himself under the bench in the kitchen and didn't want to come out, no matter how hard Lily Bunny tried to attract him with a chocolate bar. Only Lily Bunny's cats took pity on Lily Bunny's neurosis and intentionally fell asleep under the same bench so as not to let him feel so lonely and cold there. Lily Bear's neurosis was so upset with a nightmare that happened while Lily Bunny's neurosis was in town that he canceled all visits to town and persuaded Lily Bear to stick to the same. You know, sometimes neuroses can be very persuasive. Small talks and people who farm for their living do not get along very well, because when the small talk asks such a person, what do you think of the weather, the farmer starts to explain what he actually thinks, because weather for farmers is not an abstract topic at all. If the farmer says exactly what he thinks of the weather, the small talk might die. If you do not immediately apply a phrase like, what are you going to do for Easter? It will be too late to resuscitate the small talk. Lily Bunny was afraid to kill too many small talks at once. A die-off could cause unnecessary unrest in the community, and the Small Talks Association might step in and press charges of small talk aside, a serious offense in our culture, almost as severe as homicide. Meanwhile, homicide becomes a less severe crime because the population always grows, and people have ceased to be a rare and precious commodity. Please don't blame me for these outrageous words. I am the writer, 
presumably a truth teller, and I just write what I see on TV because I rarely go out. And what one sees on TV is convincing me that the price of human life is not very high at all, while small talk is prized very highly. Lily Bunny was worried that he didn't quite fit in. It seemed like the whole town had learned, by heart, stupid questions and no less idiotic responses. How are you spending your weekend? Not bad at all so far. Did you enjoy yourself? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. These talks made people into some sort of answering machines. Lily Bunny didn't want to engage in the mass insanity. Lily Jake took pity on Lily Bunny and activated his brain company. The micro Lily Jakes jumped out and said, Okay, guys, what's the problem? When they learned what the problem was, they laughed for half an hour, then sank into deep thought for another half an hour, and eventually came up with the following invention, the small talk generator. It consisted of a box that Lily Bear's neurosis liked to put on its head when it was especially nervous, just to feel more secure. They put two parrots inside the box and trained them to squawk 10 to 15 phrases that small talk usually consists of. Even though the birds parroted these phrases randomly, it sounded like real, fully grown small talk. Once equipped with such a sophisticated apparatus, Lily Bunny walked down the street again. How do you like the weather? The first small talk jumped on him from the sidewalk. Lily Bunny wanted to answer honestly. Not very good at all. It is late spring, but the weather is still very cold. This is not good for my vegetable garden. But such an answer would cause an immediate heart attack in poor small talk, and his sudden death could trigger an investigation. What are you, a farmer? Are you serious? And it could end with the police taking Lily Bunny and his suspicious box to the police station, or even jail. The parrots didn't want to go to jail, so they woke up when Lily Bunny encouragingly shook the box. The poor bird said, Weather, the weather is okay. It is not too bad. Are you ready for Christmas? Asked an especially disgusting small talk with a broken tooth. He had on a winter coat, despite the late spring. Lily Bunny wanted to say, It is spring, a little early to get ready for Christmas, no matter how deeply you love that holiday. But such a statement would murder the small talk, because the farther you get from the big city, the earlier people get ready for Christmas. Lily Bunny's town was so deep in the province, countryside, away from centers of civilization, that people got ready for Christmas in early spring. There are some places in the world where Christmas comes every day. The North Pole? Wrong. It happens in large corporations that cheat their investors for a couple of years in a row. Although later the poor CEOs have Yom Kippur for the rest of their lives. Christmas? Yes, I am getting ready, answered the parrots inside the box. Lily Bunny was considered a nice person who had mastered to perfection the art of small talk. People gravitated to him, and he had to leave his small talk generator in town and pick it up the following day. The parrots were exhausted, but happy because for the first time they could really enjoy their freedom of speech. Chapter 10. Lily Bunny and Modern Cosmology The professors of cosmology are universally recognized scientific celebrities. But cosmology tangles all in its sly theories. So now do we not understand how the new picture of the creation of the cabbage soup, which the uneducated masses call our universe, arose? It is unclear who cooked the cabbage soup, how it was created, how long it has existed, or how long it will continue to exist. These, the insoluble questions of our time, the respected professors of cosmology, knights of science without fear, placed before themselves when they decreed that delicate observations made 80 years ago with a super-precise telescope could only mean that what we all live in, and everything which was and will be, is nothing but cabbage soup. The remaining 80 years of science only refined the details, and in the details, as is known, well, you know who was in the details. The old Pope, when he learned what the scientists had discovered, almost died of disappointment and frustration. But after conferring with the Lord, he had a good relationship with him, he decided to approve the theory and made an elegant speech. Its effect? If the universe is nothing but cabbage soup, someone cooked it. Therefore, donations to the cataleptic church must not dry out. The professors of cabbage soup didn't accept Lily Bunny into their educated circle. They thought that the minds of Lily Bunny and his friend Lily Bear are too practical to be occupied with such fundamental theories as the universal cabbage soup. But when one professor of the cabbage soup discovered a large piece of cabbage, which irrefutably proved that the cabbage soup was actually made of cabbage, there was no end to the professor's happiness, because he was worried that what he'd found would turn out to be, 
instead of cabbage, just ordinary garbage. He invited Lily Bunny and Lily Bear to the conference to demonstrate to them his remarkable discovery. Lily Bear prepared well for this event because he wanted to explain to the scientific world his theory in which the universe is not made of cabbage soup, but porridge with raspberry jam, or PWRJ. He repeatedly experimented with porridge and could easily prove that his theory was no less, but also no more absurd than the theory of the professors of the cabbage soup. However, the porridge specially prepared by Lily Bunny for his report proved to be so unstable that it existed only a fraction of a second before Lily Bear ate it. Therefore, there was nothing to take to the conference to prove Lily Bear's claims. And as we know, extraordinary claims should have extraordinary proof. Believe me, Lily Bear had a batch of extraordinary porridge, but unfortunately he ate it all. The professors of cabbage soup didn't believe anything that couldn't be proved. They were themselves the honest people, so they did not trust another's word of honor. But the theory of Lily Bear pleased God very much, because he loved porridge with raspberry jam. Don't you like porridge with raspberry jam? It is godly food. God did not know what theory of his universe was worst at the time. He was so tired of the theory about three elephants, whales, and a turtle, that the theory of cabbage soup made no impression on him. He even decided not to come to the conference, since he was occupied with the preparation of the flood in the Sahara, which he had put off for twenty million years. His neglect had left his corner of earth especially dusty. I can imagine that once in a couple of years there is a flood in the Sahara, everyone will decide I knew some ancient secrets like Swift, who made brilliant astronomical predictions. So let me make a statement here. The flood of the Sahara is just a fruit of my imagination. Moreover, it is necessary to say, upholding the honor of the professors of cabbage soup, they took pity on God's ears and did not send him an official invitation. They only said that if he wanted, he could come. The professors of cabbage soup didn't have very good relationships with God, since one of them, namely Leibniz, said that God was not a necessary component of his scientific proofs. So the professors of cabbage soup learned to manage without God in their work, not because they denied him, but because he was not necessary to their delirious proofs. I must say that practical, i.e. applied scientists, have succeeded in the creation of apparatus that facilitates our lives. But theorists somehow failed to provide us with anything useful. They were stuck in their cabbage soup approach for 80 years, even when Mr. Super Einstein told them, with his charming German accent, This is stupid. The universe is not cabbage soup. It is a schnitzel with garden peas. SWGP theory. They did not believe it. They said, The old man is just not capable of accepting the new trends of future generations. He discovered that everything is relative, proved it by carrying everything somewhere, and then no one could find it, because he'd already brought it back. Wish he would just play his violin and stop interfering with our cabbage soup progress. You see, the statement that everything requires proof does not require proof. This is obvious, like the fact that our universe is just cabbage soup. Just look around and you will see. You can't see? What kindergarten did you graduate from? What does your diploma say? Kindergarten Diploma Hereby we acknowledge that Mr. Annoying Reader has completed the course of study in our kindergarten. Mr. Annoying Reader demonstrated scientific thinking when he managed to take his pants down before using the facilities. Now I see. You are an educated person indeed. You successfully finished the complete course of kindergarten. You can independently go to the toilet. Of course, things are forgotten with the years. We don't remember much of what we were once taught. Otherwise, how can we explain the problems encountered with such basic habits in nursing homes, for example? Hitler very clearly attempted to prove that the universe is a piece of shit, P.S. theory, and humanity almost accepted this theory because it sounded so refreshing. But there was disagreement over some aspects of practice and humanity decided to adhere to the conventional paradigm, based on the theory of cabbage soup. Moreover, scientists now try to prove that there are other bowls of cabbage soup out there. Wow, many soups. The wonder of the new multi-cabbage soups theory. Lily Bunny considered the universe a carrot, but he never shared with others his brilliant guess, although all his experiments with carrots indicated its unquestionable rightness. Lily Kitty considered the universe a jumble of noodles, because everything in it is interconnected and mutually intricate. Socrates himself wrote her an enthusiastic letter, but it was written on a wax tablet, and Lily Bear scratched it because he thought it was a toy. It was necessary to order a telephone conversation with ancient Greece, but no one answered. Everyone was hiding from the Minotaur. 
Lily J considered the universe a jar in which we, like insects, are gathered so God can scrutinize us under his magnifying glass. The cats considered the universe a large, sandy litter box. If they hadn't yet mastered it entirely, it didn't matter, because new generations of cats would arrive and finally master it completely. Those of Lily House even sent a telegram to the president, expressing appreciation for the idea he tossed out, to master the universe by spending an entire state budget in the next 20 years, so that our astronaut could be the first to piss on the sand on the surface of Mars and beyond. The people completely supported the president, because who does not secretly dream of pissing on a celestial body? Lily Bear sent a telegram to the president proposing an original, brilliant idea. Proposal of Lily Idea from Lily Bear Dear Mr. President, I propose that instead of whole astronauts we launch to Mars only one shoe. It will print the step on the surface and leave the same track it would if an astronaut stamped it. However, we won't need to feed him all the way to Mars and back. The heap of money thus saved we will divide in half, a half to you and half to me, because porridge has begun to rise in price since we are at war now. And during war, gas prices rise, then porridge prices. We can donate our shoe for this mission. Lily Bunny's left slipper gave his consent and has already begun training for the flight. With cosmic regards, Lily Bear. Lily Bunny's parrots did not know that the universe existed. Therefore, the birds quietly observed stars and galaxies as they saw them, through the telescope of Lily Bear, where the parrots lived until it was used to converse with the wife of Monsieur Sivouple. The parrots forgot the universe after the loss of their tube, which was not difficult because they did not quite know about its existence, even when they observed it. Parrots observed the universe directly, not through complex experiments with cabbage soup, porridge, or noodles. But when an object is observed directly, sometimes it does not require any explanation. Chapter 11 Lily Bunny and Fish 007 It was an ordinary morning in the Lily Bunny house. As usual, Lily Bear had beaten his plush bull, a present from a Lily Bear friend who lived in Texasistan, the country of plush bulls. Since Lily Bear got the plush bull in the mail, he engaged the beast in a bullfight called Corrida. At Lily Bear's command, and the count of three, the plush bull fell over and said, Ouch. Then Lily Bunny danced for Lily Bear the dance of the flamenco, and Lily Bear always excitedly applauded Lily Bunny, shouting, Bravo! Bravo! The only thing out of place on this morning was that Lily Bunny planned to go fishing and so danced the flamenco twice as fast as usual. Lily Bear applauded intensely to match the pace of the dance, and his paws got so hot he had to blow on them to cool them down. Plush Bull went to hurt himself onto the carpet, silently mooing innocent critical comments on Lily Bear's habit of engaging in bullfighting every morning. But we can understand, Lily Bear. He beat the plush bull only so Lily Bunny would dance the flamenco, which Lily Bunny refused to dance any other time because he was very busy. But when Lily Bear started to win against the plush bull every morning, Lily Bunny could not refuse to dance because according to a tradition that has been preserved, unchanged for centuries, someone must dance flamenco for all the winners of La Corrida. The day before, Lily Bunny had received secret information from his intelligence agency. In his lily lake had appeared fish 007, whom Lily Bunny had chased all over the globe. This fish was why Lily Bunny had organized his own intelligence agency, with headquarters so secret that even Lily Bunny himself forgot their location. Luckily, the headquarters continued to operate, sending him valuable information about the weather and recommending plants for sowing. But the information Lily Bunny was waiting for was hard to obtain. Lily Bunny's intelligence agency was reluctant to release the location of Fish 007, who Lily Bunny had almost caught. One time he spent 24 hours in a hiding place right in front of Fish 007's nose. The second time he ambushed Fish 007 near the spy's special apartment under the Red Sea, then in the White Sea, and another time in a semi-dry sea, aged to perfection for five years. Now when Lily Bunny got the information that Fish 007 had shown up in his own Lily Lake, right across from the house, he just couldn't let it go. It was about his reputation as a secret agent and the salvation of the human race from the terrifying spy activities of Fish 007, who, frankly speaking, hadn't done anything terrible. It was just a small, modest, small-mouthed bass, but Lily Bunny decided to play spy games with it and appointed it Fish 007. Now listen, if Lily Bear was allowed to engage himself in La Corrida with the plush bull every morning, why couldn't Lily Bunny play spy games with a dangerous double agent? 
Fish 007, who was now working simultaneously for two enemy intelligence agencies, the Maritime and Lake-Time agencies. This was probably just the fruit of Lily Bunny's fanciful imagination, but who cared? It could have been worse. It could have been a vegetable of his imagination. Then Lily Bunny would have gotten really, really serious. He would have made clear to everybody that bunnies are very serious indeed when it comes to vegetables. My rigorous reader, you might say that my hero, Lily Bunny, is just fooling around, and that I am just fooling around with him, that my text has too many words and not many of them are really touching. You might say there are probably some touching words in my text, but that it is difficult to find them, especially after you have lost all hope and thrown my book under the sofa. You were fixing up the place before your guest's visit, paying stupid homage to the idiotic tradition of fixing up the place before the guests arrive, just for the sake of allowing them to mess it up once again, when, after all, it was messy in the first place. Now you can make some surprising discoveries under your sofa. Among the unidentified articles of someone's dress and the half-eaten apple someone attempted to consume before the dawn of the last economic crisis, you find my book and open it randomly to this very page. Read my long sentences, get angry again, and throw it back under the sofa, completing the infernal cycle of obtaining and losing hope all over again, that you might find all touching words in my book listed in alphabetical order. This is a pity, because you could find many hooks, especially fishing hooks, that could hook your soul if you would agree to write on yourself 007 and grow scales, because fish with other numbers didn't interest Lily Bunny at all, as you might understand. So you say I am fooling around. First of all, you are fooling around trying to fix up your place before the guests arrive. You are also fooling around not reading my book and throwing it under the sofa. You are fooling around even if you do read my book and search for the touching words. You are always fooling around. Everyone is always fooling around. I can easily prove that the whole world is continuously fooling around. Look at the serious faces of the leaders on TV. They are so serious and impenetrable, but it always seems as if they will turn to the side and burst out laughing, and by that prove to the whole planet that they were just fooling around. Does this surprise you? The world was always fooling around. Please read the world's history from this point of view. Of course, you will find many economic reasons, ideological struggles of interests, but the bottom line is that great people always fool around. Look at Alexander the Great, look at Napoleon, and read our entire history, making this new anti-fooling around analysis. You will detect that fooling around is the ultimate basis for all of the historic developments of humanity. But most professional fool-arounders are intelligent people once they get to the summit of their power, because they are not amateurs at fooling around. They do this for a living. Intelligence services are the only department of the state that fools around completely officially. In what other department can you report the expenses of attendance of a whorehouse? Or receipts for buying beer and whiskey, trying to get innocent pedestrians drunk in order to collect from them valuable information about their private lives, which are gray and boring like everybody else's? and file reports about these secret meetings, carefully archiving them for decades with classified access. Later, they have to clean up the evidence of their spy activity by dealing in certain ways with the source of information. The options for this are plentiful. You may choose from a list, assassinate, or more precisely, annihilate, asphyxiate, blow away, bump off, butcher, crucify, dispatch, do in, drown, dump, electrocute, eradicate, erase, execute, exterminate, extirpate, finish off, hang, knock off, liquidate, lynch, massacre, murder, neutralize, obliterate, poison, polish off, put away, put down in Chinatown, rub out, slaughter, slay, smother, snuff, strangle, suffocate, waste, or somehow else wipe them from the face of the earth. Even though they charge the government with all these colorful activities, most of the time you'll be surprised to find the innocent individual destined to die in a most brutal and horrible way, continues to thrive, despite all the threats mentioned above. Because in intelligence services, mistakes happen, just like everywhere else. Or the operatives fake the report of liquidation and spend the money on extra beer. While intelligence officers approach innocent pedestrians to collect valuable information, on the very next street, airplanes fly into skyscrapers, buildings get blown up, terrorists take hostages. But this is not a problem because the paperwork is in order and carefully archived. If the paperwork is in order, everything is fine and in order, because that's what is left of any sort of activity, loads of paper and nothing else. 
We cannot criticize intelligence services because we can see only their failures. We don't know how many terrorist attempts were prevented. Maybe at this very moment, as you are lazily sitting on your sofa and reading these lines, some anonymous intelligence officer is saving the world. The world clings by its pale, childish hands to the edge of a deep chasm, and the intelligence officer is trying to pull it back while we sit here on the sofa and know nothing of what's going on. The only result of the operation that will remain to history will be a tiny wrinkled receipt, a train ticket, because he took the train to get to the chasm where the world was hanging. If this is the only ticket, it means he didn't make it back. I always wondered which he didn't make. If there is a return ticket, it means he made it back and the world was saved. If the world isn't saved, we won't know, because we will all die at once. And you say the intelligence service is not fooling around professionally? Oh, this is an intriguing world of receipts for beer paid by the government budget, a world that moves ahead when you need to go backwards. Maneuvers to the left when you need it to the right. Complicated double, triple, quadruple games in a multipolar world where everybody is good and evil simultaneously, and everybody loses track of who is working for whom and who is paying for what and where we should all run, because intelligence penetrates everywhere. They have healthy appetites, are very reserved, and don't suffer from any sort of dignity, which is usually amputated by cosmetic surgery from each spook on the government's account. Didn't you know that dignity is dealt with now by cosmetic surgery? Previously, dignity was an internal organ, but now it has started to swell so much that it is considered an external organ and may disgrace the surface of the face and other parts of the body. This is why they started to brand people and amputate dignity moles to prevent them from spreading and metastasizing to the true honesty, which in the modern world is considered a malignant disease. I don't mean the benign fool's honesty, which grows in a majority of citizens of wealthy Western societies, in which they start to demonstrate naked, without special honesty covering undergarments. This is called honest nudism. This honest nudism can make you sick all over again, and it has nothing in common with true malignant honesty, because benign honesty grows from another type of tissue, a part of the coward gland, which is located in the two-faced ass region of the human body. True honesty grows from one's soul, the organ destined for surgical extraction, as in the earliest stage. I'm sorry I became occupied with these medical descriptions. If you already got your honesty and soul fixed, you can skip over what I have written. I'm writing it for those who still have these features on their bodies, which can be pretty dangerous, not only to them, but to our society as a whole. Lily Bunny got ready to go fishing, and fishing for him was no joke. He took all of his fishing equipment out of the closet and carefully reviewed it. List of Lily Bunny's fishing equipment. Category 1. Fishing rods. Fishing rod with laser-guided missile. Fishing rod with sniper optics. Fishing rod with video hook and fiber optic fishing line. Fishing rod with nuclear-powered floater. 300-ton displacement. Fishing rod with night vision. Fishing rod with day-not vision. Special fishing rod, LGX-344. Classified technology will be declassified in the year 2075. Relax, we won't live that long. Category 2. Chum. Chocolate cake. Box of 20 whiskey bottles. 10 exotic Thai dancers. Narcotic powder from the fruit of the get stone tree. Category 3. Bait. Well-fed elephant. Greenland whale. Loch Ness monster. And why do you think no one can find her in Loch Ness Lake? because for the last few years she has been living in Lily Bunny's closet with his fishing equipment. Lily Bunny recruited Nessie in Scotland by blackmailing her, pretty friendly-like, threatening to tell the British press that she has not a tail like a real dinosaur, but a tail like a bunny. If such facts leak to the British press, the paparazzi won't relax until Nessie is in a deadly accident in a tunnel in France. Category 4. Safety Equipment. Spaceship for emergency evacuation of the Earth's population in case the fishing trip takes an unexpected turn. Life jacket with three-day supply of porridge for Lily Bear, who wasn't going with Lily Bunny, but just in case was wearing a life jacket while sitting at home, consuming his safety porridge. Life jackets for the fish, just in case they fall over the edge of the boat. Whistle for disinformation. Flashlight for flashbacks. Category 5. Accompanying documentation. Official certificate stating Lily Bunny is not Lily Bunny. Official certificate stating Lily Bunny is in fact Lily Bunny. Official certificate issued to Lily Bunny certifying that he both is Lily Bunny and is not Lily Bunny at the same time, for fooling the enemy. 
Official certificate issued to Lily Bunny certifying that he is a cat. Official certificate issued to Lily Bunny certifying that he is a hare. Canadian passport under the name of Mr. Not Spy with Lily Bunny's photograph. License for fishing in forbidden areas. Document forbidding fishing in allowed areas. For justification why you weren't fishing when you could fish but didn't want to. A photograph of international terrorist Osam being let in, in a fish costume, in case he dresses as a fish and settles in Lily Lake. Category 6. Special Nets Ordinary Fishing Net 1. Lily Bunny loaded all this equipment into a paddle boat that Nemo built specifically for Lily Bunny from the spare parts left over from the construction of his ship, the Nautilus. Lily Bunny's boat was assembled in various dry docks all over the world. Lily Bunny set sail and departed for the high seas, which in this case were high lakes. He went fishing alone because he always took the most difficult assignments alone, according to the unspoken code of honor of all spies, which required them to work alone in order to spare themselves the need to kill witnesses, as he gave this assignment to himself. Another code of honor of spies applied. If you give an assignment to yourself, go and do it yourself. Lily Bunny got on course, heading north, south, east, west, which probably sounds impossible for the ordinary bunny, but is very common in the spy world. You simply split and head in different directions. Splitting is a very important function for any spy because if you do not split with others, they will simply take everything and leave you with nothing. Fish 007, however incredible it may sound, was ready for the attack. It is true that this fish was simply an ordinary fish, but after years of hiding from that crazy bunny, how the fish referred to Lily Bunny in private, he learned many spy methods and recruited the moles on Lily Bunny's lawn. Fish said he was a mole and only dressed like a fish. That was how Fish 007 convinced the moles to be recruited, for they didn't want to question their ability to see, since they obtained sunglasses from Lily Bunny's sunglasses pack. The moles worked undercover and learned that Lily Bunny had information regarding the location of Fish 007. Fish 007 immediately changed the number that had been written on its side ever since Lily Bunny captured and held it in the Red Sea. Fish 007 licked his fin, rubbed away the 007 on his side, and wrote the new number, 008, which was very crafty because Fish 007 could then without worrying, promenade all over the shore without Lily Bunny being any the wiser. But Lily Bunny was no idiot. He cracked down on this deceiving maneuver, jumped out of the boat, and caught Fish 007-008 with his net. Lily Bunny and Fish 007 lived happily together and went to dry off and have some tea with buns in the gazebo, where all the other inhabitants of the Lily House joined them. At the party were Lily Bear in his life jacket, who spent all the time Lily Bunny was fishing at home. Lily Kitty... Lily Jake, Lily Bunny's two slippers, and the two parrots. Only the cats did not join the tea party because they were still sleeping, or had already gone to bed, and generally didn't drink tea with fishes anyway, for personal reasons. And you say intelligence doesn't fool around? Chapter 12 Lily Bunny and the Berry Pie Once upon a time, Lily Bunny baked his famous berry pie. I don't like works of literature that tell about different meals, but never mention the recipe. And then after a hundred years, the readers have to guess what the classic means by mentioning particular delicious foods, which causes complete disappointment with classic authors. Being confident that I am going to become a classic author, I want to avoid this tiny disadvantage of my colleagues, and I promise that from now on I'll try to give you detailed recipes of all delicacies mentioned in my ingenious enlightenment, that just can't become anything other than a timeless classic. By the way, Lily Bunny learned to bake this pie from Hans Christian Andersen, who lived in Denmark at the time, where Lily Bunny was visiting. Lily Bunny went there to save the girl who was selling matches on Christmas Eve to prevent her from dying of cold, as was described later in one of Andersen's tales. Lily Bunny met Mr. Andersen while watching the girl dying, and that was how they were acquainted. Anderson invited Lily Bunny and the girl to his place and treated them to his Danish cake, and then Anderson promised Lily Bunny that he would look after the girl and make sure she did not die, so Lily Bunny left. The girl died the next night anyway because Anderson was watching her die in order to write his terrible fairy tale anyway. Anderson knew that he was going to write a timeless classic, and he readily sacrificed this poor soul for his eternal success, with which he still scares new generations of innocent youth. Why do people use the deaths of others as sources of entertainment? I don't see anything entertaining about death unless it happens within you. 
Then you are so preoccupied with the serious procedure that no movie or computer game can compete. I hope these lines won't be misunderstood as a promotion for suicidal inclinations. I am just saying not to make fun of another's death. You know why? Because it is not funny. Now, back to the pie. I will now proudly present you the recipe. First, bake a tart shell. Secondly, spread around a mixture of vanilla pudding and milk, or custard, inside the shell, and let sit in the refrigerator for at least one hour. After you have your tart shell full of vanilla pudding and milk, all that's left is to spread berries over it in a decorative way. Spread the berries to your personal liking. Once Lily Bunny baked his huge berry pie, it was the size of the annual budget of a small country, which I cannot name here. Naming it could damage the reputation of the United Frustrations Organization, or UFO, of which this country is part. This country has been engaged in such immoral actions that mentioning its name in vain might destabilize the world order. This is the last thing I want to do because I am not quite ready to look for another planet to settle on yet. To make a long story short, let's dub this country CSBP, the country that stole the berry pie. And what do you think? It has just stolen the pie. Lily Bunny baked the pie and put it on the windowsill, and the CSBP snuck up, grabbed the pie, and ran away. Lily Bunny didn't have time to blink, even though Lily Bunny was a champion of artistic blinking and could blink in a very professional way. Lily Bear and Lily Jake chased the CSBP, but it had very long feet. There are states with very long hands, and you had better not irritate them because they will get you no matter where you go. But some states have very long feet, and you should watch out because they can steal something from you and run away. And so this country ran away to its national territory and didn't issue visas to Lily Bear and Lily Jake. They stood in front of the national border of CSBP and came home empty-handed, which is better than handicapped, which you could get if you tried to get in without visas. In the country, CSBP, the arrival of the berry pie received a lot of support. In the polls, they got the following results. Poll of public opinion of citizens of the state of CSBP. 55% completely supported the theft of the pie. 35% thought that CSBP needed to steal something else. 8% thought there was a need to steal Lily Bunny's slippers, too. Only 2% considered how lawful it was to steal the pie, but supported it anyway, because they were afraid that if they were considered to have not supported it enough, they would not get their share of the pie and would probably be killed, which is equally unfortunate. Do you understand this problem? Democracy has to comply with the will of the majority, and if the majority supports stealing, the country should steal. Otherwise, it cannot be considered a democratic country. If it doesn't steal, it will be acting against the will of the people, and this will make it an anti-people state. In the world, everyone respected the will of the inhabitants of CSBP, especially because the number of international democratic representatives making sure the polls were accurately democratic was higher than the number of citizens of CSBP themselves. The state of CSBP was considered people's state, and so the government decided to divide Lily Bunny's pie between all of the inhabitants. This is where the problem started. As we mentioned before, the pie was bigger than the annual budget of CSBP, and this country was not used to such large financial operations. Nor, we must frankly say, were they ready for such a large responsibility. This non-preparedness started a civil war in the state of CSBP, because in some countries you don't need much reason to start a civil war. There were two major parties, the party of length and the party of width. These two parties were separated in their views on how to cut the pie. The length party wanted to cut the pie lengthwise, and the width party wanted to cut it widthwise. What the two parties didn't realize was that both cuts were the same because the pie was round. They couldn't have known how absurd their argument was because soon after receiving the pie, the leaders of CSBP deposited it in a Swiss bank so none of the party members got a chance to see it. You might say that all pies are round, and the parties should have known that anyway. But in a place like CSBP, pies are very rare, and the roundest object the populace was familiar with was a brick, which is why the terms length and width weren't very distinguished in their language. This didn't matter much because these parties hated each other anyway, and were just looking for a reason to start a war. The United Frustrations Organization stepped in immediately and demanded that the war be stopped and the pie be divided equally among all the people. But the state of CSBP didn't care much what the UFO said. Do you believe in the UFO, my dearest reader? I don't, not anymore, and I wonder if anyone really does. We have to say that the state of CSBP was engaged in some sort of war for the last 50 years. 
short history of the wars of the state of CSBP. 1952 to 1958, the War of the Half-Eaten Apple and Three Cigar Butts. 1958 to 1962, the War of the Squashed Lemon. 1962 to 1964, the Sausage Revolution. 1964 to 1968, the Anti-Sausage Counter-Revolution. 1968 to 1969, the Tomato Massacre. 1969 to 1978, the Plum Resistance. 1978 to 1985, the Peach Impeachment and Apricot Blockade. 1985 to 1992, the Watermelon Incident. 1992 to 1999, the Shut Your Mouth Conflict. 1999 to 2004, the Spoiled Food Blockade. 2005 to present, the Lily Pie War. The Swiss bank was terrified of terrorist attacks and secretly announced to the press that they were transferring their most valuable entity, which was actually the cause of a civil war, the famous Lily Pie, to the country that could assure its safety, because it was the most self-confident country in the world. The president of the most self-confident country in the world ordered a safe box in which to hold the Lily Pie in captivity and asked everyone to leave so he could examine the cause of the civil war in person. The president opened the safe, and, oh God, it was empty, or at least he thought this is what he would say if he ever had to testify, and presidents of the most self-confident country in the world never lie, unless they really have to. Until now, nobody knows who ate the pie, because in fact nobody knew the pie was eaten, but the president of the most self-confident country did not let this information leak outside the world of his square office. The president locked the empty safe back up and didn't tell anyone it was empty, because he realized he didn't have a good alibi to prove his innocence, and he wanted to prevent his rival party from accusing him of eating the cause of the Civil War in CSBP. Any court would consider that the president was the last who saw the pie alive, and he would spend the rest of his days, and probably all of his fortune, trying to prove he wasn't the one who ate the lily pie. The Civil War hasn't ended yet, because nobody in the world knows there's no more reason to fight. The president of the most self-confident country in the world wisely decided that the state of war is a natural state for the state of CSPP, and the reasons for war are not what are important. The important thing is who can be accused in the current situation. Let's do an analysis together. You might say that the primary cause of war is the people of the state of CSBP. I'm sorry, are you insane? Do you want to say that the people of CSBP are all bad? Tell me something, are you against the people? The people cannot be bad, they are always good. Maybe it's the government, but the government was just doing what the people expected it to do. Maybe the Swiss bank should be blamed. But what was wrong in trying to ensure that they wouldn't wind up under a terrorist bomb? The president of the most self-confident country in the world cannot be blamed for anything, because it would cost you more to blame him than anyone else. All nations need a good working relationship with the most self-confident country in the world, and blaming its president would ruin that relationship very fast leaving you with a well-manufactured missile aimed at your kitchen as a token of appreciation for your peacemaking efforts. Well, the conclusion is clear. The only one we can blame this on is Lily Bunny for making his Lily Pie in the first place, because if you arrange to bake a pie on the same scale as a small but proud nation's economy, you must eat it while hiding in the basement, if you don't want to cause such colorful consequences as a civil war. Please don't blame anything on politicians. They are the gray heroes of our times. They work hard to make sure we are safe, and if they sometimes hide secrets and empty safes, they are doing it only for our own well-being. Chapter 13. Lily Bunny Hires a Cow Lily Bunny dreamed of keeping a cow for a long time. He, as a person living by natural economy, certainly required a cow, but all the inhabitants of Lily Bunny's house were against it. Lily Bear didn't want to share Lily Bunny's attention with anybody. Lily Kitty was afraid the cow would spoil her haircut. Lily Jake was afraid the cow would lick off some important item of his, because even without a cow, many of his important items kept disappearing, as though a cow had licked them off. The cats were categorically against a cow because they thought cows were dirty creatures, as cows don't wash themselves with their tongues. The parrots repeated everything after every one, so they were naturally against a cow and Lily Bunny slippers were afraid that a cow would wear them bare hoof, and that would be their objective, if not to say, concrete end. Only the old grandfather clock was for a cow, because, as you remember, the clock was desperately in need of fresh dairy products. 
Lily Bunny decided to try to find a decent cow anyway, and then, he thought, he'd begin to treat everybody to fresh milk and cheesecakes, and their attitude towards the cow would soften. He didn't say a word about buying a cow. Not that Lily Bunny was short of money. Lily Bunny was economical, not greedy or stingy, but economical, so he had enough money. The thing was, he lived in a free country, and in a free country, cows had rights as full as the rights of other citizens, say roosters or goats. The time when cows were regarded as cattle long ago had passed. Now cows are regarded as working class, which is more pleasant, believe me. Cows have received freedom, as did the Oriental women in their time, and they commenced to choose their occupation, place of residence, and terms of feeding. And so, Lily Bunny placed the following ad in the local newspaper. Required. A cow with higher education. Full-time. Accommodations included. Experience and recommendations are a must. Apply in Lily Bunny's house. Knock three times. Lily Bunny didn't want to give his phone number because he was afraid there would be a lot of senseless lowing on the phone. Better he thought they come directly and knock with a hoof on the door. And to be sure he would not mistake them for his neighbor, Mr. Squeezehard, coming for an onion and sunglasses, or his other neighbor, Mr. Bolthead, coming for a bag of bolts, he added the request to knock three times exactly. Really, Lily Bunny isn't a yo-yo to answer the door once with bolts, once with onions. And besides, the cow might not like his appearance with these items on the threshold. Cows are fastidious nowadays. They wouldn't want to work in an establishment that looked strange or queer to them. As for higher education, it's now required of any cow. Not that the cow yields more milk, nor is the milk tastier because of higher education. It's simply that there are established standards and criteria in society, and in the country where Lily Bunny lived, higher education of cows became traditional. Some especially unable cows were given bachelor's degrees in cow sciences on their general length of service, without examination. But the majority of cows chose other occupations, because cow freedom meant that any cow might self-determine freely. Lily Bunny certainly could look for the cow on acquaintance, according to his neighbor's recommendation, so to say. But he didn't want to turn to such domesticity at once, because he too respected the basic democratic principles of the society in which he lived, and he wanted to give all cows equal opportunity on the labor market. The consciousness of the country's population was at a high level, especially regarding questions that didn't so much concern the pockets or personal benefits of the citizens, though Lily Bunny was a conscious citizen not for show, but for the general improvement of all kinds of important matters, which abound in a progressive society. Society very much loved Lily Bunny for it, especially when, in rare moments of lucidity, it bought fresh carrots and fennel off him. The first to knock at Lily Bunny's house door was a brown cow with big white spots. Lily Bunny would prefer a classic black and white cow, but he moaned from delight and besides, to state openly his preferences about color had been considered illegal and outright discriminatory for quite a long time now. Therefore, everybody continued to be guided by his or her preferences, but silently. Lily Bunny invited the cow to his office. You cannot do without an office in modern natural economy, and began the interview. I require you know a cow in my establishment. And is your establishment big? The brown cow asked severely. I wouldn't say so, confessed Lily Bunny modestly. And there are how many other cows? There are no other cows. I require a cow. Lily Bunny answered, Precisely because there are no cows. Well, surely you don't expect me to do all the cow work? The brown cow stood up angrily. I'll feed you well, and I don't need more than one cow. Lily Bunny tried to persuade the cow. I do not work at small enterprises. The brown cow cut him off and left without saying goodbye. Slamming the door, the cow uttered, What a shame. How do the authorities permit that? Lily Bunny was especially upset by that last phrase. Like every decent citizen, Lily Bunny was afraid of authorities, although he didn't quite understand what was amiss in the fact that his establishment was small and had no cow. He judged that, in general, there wasn't anything especially criminal, but as the saying goes, God protects those who protect themselves. Therefore, Lily Bunny phoned Mr. Troublesen, his lawyer. After long excuses that he didn't have time for phone conversations, and things like this were not for discussion over the phone, he at last proceeded to enlighten Lily Bunny. Being a small-scale enterprise wasn't accepted in this country, and it was considered criminal to some extent. Although there wasn't a definite law against it, judiciary practice showed that small enterprises invariably suffered in court, whereas large enterprises usually dodged trouble and avoided court. 
why should they prosecute me? Lily Bunny sobbed into the receiver. Get yourself a cow, advised Mr. Troublesome, avoiding a straight answer. Lily Bunny hung up and wiped his nose. Hiring a cow wasn't a choice anymore. It was a vital necessity. It appeared that the absence of a cow in a natural economy was equated by public opinion and judiciary practice, if not to a major felony, then to something like fraud. How could an establishment lack a cow? The public deception is evident. Thank God he didn't have to wait long. Another cow, of Lily Bunny's favorite color, knocked on his door, and the happy Lily Bunny led her to his office. Does the fact that I don't have a cow at present bother you? asked Lily Bunny uncertainly. Oh no, not at all, the black and white cow answered, then began to talk about herself. I've graduated the conservatory, the faculty of artistic whistle. Oh please, whistle something, Lily Bunny was delighted. He knew the cow should be milked early in the morning, and music could brighten up the early yawning hour. Moo, whistled the cow. But that's not whistling, that's lowing. Well, I graduated the Faculty of Artistic Whistle, specializing in artistic low. You'd like the cows to whistle? No, no, Lily Bunny immediately surrendered. It's not important. Milk is more important. What? The cow was deeply indignant. You are going to milk me? Oh, no. The cow jumped up, hastily collected her diplomas, and left. Lily Bunny was perplexed. Well, he thought, what shall I do? Fortunately, somebody knocked the door, and Lily Bunny ran to open it. A huge bull stood on the threshold. Excuse me, said Lily Bunny uncertainly, having nevertheless led the bull to his office, but I require a cow. Aren't you familiar with the law against sexism? asked the bull imperturbably. This law provides measures for realization of the state policy to vote for the assurance of equal rights, freedom, and opportunities for cows and bulls for the prevention of discrimination by sex as a necessary condition of stable and steady development of this country. Lily Bunny was outright frightened. I won't hire you, not because you are a bull, but because you are not a cow. That is, not because you are not a cow, but because you don't give milk. The bull's reply was even more confusing. You didn't write in your ad that you require milk. You wrote that you require a cow. You should write a bull or a cow. The law demands it, and I'll insist on my rights. The bull began to press on Lily Bunny. But fortunately, Lily Bunny's 30-gallon samovar entered the room to announce that it had begun to boil, and everybody had to go drink tea. Seeing the huge samovar, the bull lowered his eyes and agreed to forgive Lily Bunny his ignorance of the laws, although certainly ignorance of the law doesn't release anyone from abiding by it. You see, when the bull tried to press his rights in another place, he had been scalded with boiled water. Apparently, he was afraid of repeating that experience with the samovar that puffed and glared very convincingly. By the end of the evening, Lily Bunny's rash personnel policy had broken so many laws that if his visitors hadn't been really kind and mild, in general, and his samovar so impressive, Lily Bunny would probably be sitting to the end of his days in prison for all kinds of discrimination. Other applicants came to Lily Bunny. There were among them a professor of mad cow disease, experts on transforming cows into pigs and back, and a French chef specializing in beef a la Chateaubriand. There were many well-educated cows. Cow engineers, cow programmers, cow lawyers, cow choreographers, and even cow hereditary adventurers. However, no candidate agreed to give milk. Lily Bunny became extremely sad, but applicants continued to arrive, which totally upset his natural economy. All day long, Lily Bunny was engaged with obstinate applicants, each of whom made a row his own way. But the French cook raged especially and it seemed that all the candidates weren't really interested in employment, they had suspicious snouts and interrogated Lily Bunny in detail about his establishment, sometimes checking documents and accounts. They were especially strict with the living accommodations. The majority insisted on a two-three-room cow shed with a phone and bathroom, a corporate mobile phone, a car, and shares in Lily Bunny's business. When they found out that Lily Bunny didn't have shares because he wasn't Lily Bunny Corporation Limited, but a self-employed entrepreneur, the candidates sometimes contemptuously spat on Lily Bunny's office floor. One cow even left cow dung on Lily Bunny's carpet. At first, Lily Bunny tried to persuade the cows that his accommodations were fine and that cows usually don't have difficulties giving milk, but his visitors didn't even think to accept his offer. To stop the nightmare, Lily Bunny was compelled to place a new ad in the local newspaper. No cow is required, especially with higher education, neither on full-time nor on part, and no living accommodations are provided. 
Experience and recommendations will not help. Do not apply at Lily Bunny's house, and especially do not knock three times. The ad cost Lily Bunny dearly, because each no word cost one dollar, whereas a usual word cost only twenty-five cents. The negative particles were so costly because the newspaper didn't want to look too negative. Lily Bunny was also compelled to hide from the public the fact that he needed a cow, because he had confused the public with this ad, especially printing it in the newspaper. And so law-abiding Lily Bunny became criminal all over, and even acquired a habit of looking around when he left his house to check whether he was being watched. One night, when Lily Bunny's neighbor, Mr. Squeezehard, came to borrow an onion and sunglasses, which he needed, as was mentioned earlier, for extracting maple syrup from birch firewood, Lily Bunny broke down and asked whether he could recommend a decent cow who would agree to give milk. To Lily Bunny's surprise, Mr. Squeezehard immediately offered him his cow, Peggy, Pegasus abbreviated. Lily Bunny was beside himself with delight. Peggy the cow didn't ask much and promised to give milk every day. Peggy the cow came to work the next day, giving a bucket full of milk. Lily Bunny began to receive a pail of milk every morning. He didn't even have to milk her because she milked herself. Lily Bunny suggested Peggy arrange machine milking, with help from Lily Bunny's car, who in her childhood thought she was a cow, had even grazed on the lawn, and until lately dripped something out of her all the time, sometimes oil and sometimes gasoline. But Peggy the cow nearly reared. No, no, she cried. No milking. I'm doing it all by myself. And Lily Bunny gave up. The problems didn't start immediately, but in time domestic accessories began to vanish from Lily Bunny's house. Watches, toys, umbrellas, caps, cups, paintings, wines from Lily Bear's wine cellar, can and bottle openers, flasks, lighters, left slippers, cigarettes, and even ashtrays with cigarette butts. At first, Lily Bunny blamed Klepti, the house gremlin of troll nationality, who was a chronic kleptomaniac, and filched everything that wasn't nailed to the floor, or the wall or ceiling. But Lily Bunny checked his closet and found nothing except right slippers' old glasses. And then Lily Jake's thermometer, the sand thermometer that Lily Bear made for Lily Jake. If the sand is warm, the weather is hot, and if the sand is cold, the weather is cold. Vanished. Lily Jake was very upset. However, a very similar thermometer soon appeared in a local junk shop, and Lily Bunny purchased it for Lily Jake. Lily Jake declared that it was his old thermometer, because he once had buried a coin in it. He now dug the coin out. All secrets were revealed at last when one summer day Lily Bunny went into the cow shed to get his next pail of milk, but found neither milk nor Peggy the cow. On a straw bed lay a note, obviously written by a hoof. Gone south, we'll be back by autumn. Kisses, Peggy the cow. From his visit to the country, Lily Bunny knew that cows usually depart for the south in summer, like all normal vacationers, so he wasn't surprised. However, having examined the cow shed, Lily Bunny found a whole mountain of empty milk bottles, all is clear now, Lily Bunny bit his lip. Peggy didn't give milk herself, she bought it in a dairy shop, and she got the money selling things from the house. You couldn't expect her to buy milk on her salary, could you? It's a pity, said Lily Bunny. Why didn't she admit she wasn't giving milk? We'd love her anyway. Peggy the cow had stolen and sold Lily Bunny's thermos, which he liked very much. That's why he was so upset. Well, the cow will come back, and I'll teach her we are not angry with her but that she isn't to hand things from the house over to the junk shop. Let her live with us and receive the cow's salary, and we really should buy milk in the dairy shop anyway. Now I understand why Mr. Squeezehard gave the cow to you so readily. That's why he extracts maple syrup from birch firewood at— She's beggared the old man absolutely, Left Slipper declared. Maybe you should sack her all the same, Right Slipper asked uncertainly. No, a natural economy is impossible without a cow, said Lily Bunny severely and pensively looked at the sky. When will my beloved Peggy return from the south? Chapter 14 Lily Bunny and the International Lily Bunny Day Instead of an Afterward You won't be surprised to find out that the world began to respect Lily Bunny so much after all he had done for it, and especially after all he hadn't done to it, that the United Frustrations Organization, or UFO, appointed Lily Bunny Citizen of the World and declared August 24th Lily Bunny's Birthday, International Lily Bunny Day. I think it is necessary to respect and celebrate people, not only because they've done something to the world, but also because they haven't done something to it. For example, in 30 chapters of the novel, Lily Bunny, 
One, still didn't kill 50 million people. Two, didn't participate in any massacres. Three, didn't invent the A-bomb. Four, didn't drop an A-bomb. And five, didn't invent any kind of theory that makes a couple of continents almost strangle themselves. Isn't this list of merits sufficient to consider Lily Bunny an exceptional person on a world scale? It seems to me that not having done anything at all, Lily Bunny has brought real benefit to our world. You will say that you, too, did nothing from the list above, and why are you not considered an outstanding person? Nobody is declaring your international day. You've forgotten, perhaps, Lily Bunny might be you. Taking into account some clauses specified in the preface. That means it is your international Lily Bunny day. Yes, don't work this day if you wish. Show this book to your employer and don't go to work. And if he threatens to fire you, peacefully threaten to engage in natural economy and persuade all your colleagues to do likewise. So he, your employer, will go west with all his business. And if you are the employer, threaten your workers that if they do mischief while you are on holiday, you too will engage in natural economy and all their workplaces will go west. In short, having provided yourself with an additional day off, you can start to win yourself other holidays. Here follows the brief calendar of holidays for which you, as a rightful Lily Bunny, can safely struggle. January 1st, Lily Bunny's New Year, coincides with the official one. January 3rd, Lily Bunny's Day for finishing up all the tasty leftovers of the New Year feast. February 8th, Lily Bunny's Mailbox's birthday. February 23rd, Peggy the Cow's birthday. March 1st, March Hair Day, celebrated by putting pink paper ears on and baking carrot pie. March 23rd, Lily Kitty's birthday. April 1st, Klepti the House Gremlin's birthday. April 7th, additional International Lily Bunny Day, if the celebration in August wasn't enough. April 11th, Lily Jake's birthday. April 13th, on Friday, the day of both parrots hatching. April 29th, Lily Bunny's Gramophone's birthday. May 1st, the day of sticking out our tongues at Karl Marx. May 15th, Hamster Hamlet's birthday. June 1st, the day of Fish 007's capture. June 2nd, Beja the Cat's birthday. June 5th, the day of Lily Bunny's victory over the fox. August 13th, Lily Bunny's favorite grandmother's birthday. August 16th, the day of Lily Bunny's sponge's recovery. August 24th, International Lily Bunny Day. October 1st, Golden Cat's birthday. October 11th, Lily Bear's birthday. November 7th, Lily Bunny's left slipper's birthday. December 24th, Lily Bunny's right slipper's birthday. Simply coincides with Christmas. There you are. With such a cheerful calendar of additional holidays, you can begin to live anew. Joyfully and happily. 26 new holidays. Only to think. And you can invent your own additional holidays. And when should we work, you may ask? But work is a bad habit. For example, Lily Bear's brother from Texasistan, the country of plush bulls, says using folk language, Horses die of work, ears go deaf, and eyes go cataractic. Though he himself works much, because Texasistan needs to prosper, it won't do otherwise. In short, you can work when you are free from holidays, if you cannot live without work. You see, holiday isn't when you don't go to work and fart all day long on a sofa or slave in your own garden. Holiday is when you want to sing. When was the last time you wanted to sing? Before what revolution? But Lily Bunny sings every day, because for him, every day is a holiday. Maybe not official, but very cheerful, and he engages in natural economy without days off, because for him, it's not work, but a way of life. So when the people of the earth declared Lily Bunny's birthday International Lily Bunny Day, he invited everybody to his house. On the previous evening, he made a sea of compote and baked a continent of berry pies. In the morning, Lily Bunny woke and couldn't find his glasses. He fumbled and fumbled on the bedside table, but the glasses just weren't there. How so, he thought. Maybe I've dropped them into the compote. But then he looked closer, and here on the bedside table lay a humble, huge present wrapped up in gift paper. Lily Bunny read the attached note. The present appeared to be from Klepti, the house gremlin. There were Lily Bunny's glasses, his favorite thermos, and Lily Bear's dumpling mold, all wrapped together. Lily Bunny even shed a few tears. How pleasant it was to receive, on such a holiday, a present from Klepti, the kleptomaniac himself. The return to us of something stolen occurs so seldom. Then Lily Bunny was accosted with congratulations by his neurosis. Oh, Lily Bunny, 
cried Lily Bunny's neurosis. We've grown older by one more year. Oh, what'll happen? Oh, what'll happen? We shall die soon. Where will they bury us? Calm down. Lily Bunny gently stroked his neurosis on its tussled head. We aren't nuclear waste products. They'll bury us somehow. And Lily Bunny yawned sweetly. Lily Bunny's neurosis calmed down and gave Lily Bunny a key holder with a prayer that saves one from wild animals and other misfortunes you can meet on the road. Lily Bear gave Lily Bunny a dog named Kolbasa. Lily Bear used to give Kolbasa to Lily Bunny every birthday, painstakingly wrapping him in gift paper. The dog resisted desperately, wagging his tail and kicking his extremities, so by the time of delivery he was already practically loose and could lick Lily Bunny's nose freely. And Lily Bear gave Lily Bunny a ring, with the inscription, I love you, which means in translation from Lily Bearish, I love Lily Bunny. Lily Kitty gave Lily Bunny a butterfly-shaped pin to pin his ears up, because he always dipped his ears in the compote, and they interfered sometimes with his agricultural activities. Lily Jake gave Lily Bunny an island in the Lily Atlantic Ocean, which his brain company, Limited, discovered. Lily Bunny landed on the island, declared its territory the territory of the state, and placed his famous flag there. The flag was proud that he represented the state authority on the island and ceased to tie himself in knots. Lily Bunny's slippers gave themselves to each other. That is, the left slipper wrapped up the right slipper as a gift to Lily Bunny, and the right slipper, while being wrapped up, asked Lily Kitty to catch and wrap the left slipper as a gift to Lily Bunny from the right slipper, and that was done. Hamster Hamlet came for a visit from his new apartment and brought as a present a whole brood of mutant mice for scaring elephants away in the future. Golden Cat gave Lily Bunny a catosynthesis manual, and they catosynthesized all morning together. Beja the Cat gave a manual on rescue from suffocation by air balloons, with a bag of air balloons for inflating and training. Charles Dickens gave Lily Bunny a big package with the inscription, To a Real Lily Bunny, from the real Charles Dickens, the paper that will endure everything. When Lily Bunny unwrapped the package, there was a roll of toilet paper. Everybody laughed until they cried, having appreciated the joke of the great realist. Global warming gave Lily Bunny a clear, sunny day, and global neglect created a carefree holiday atmosphere. The neighbor, Mr. Squeezehard, gave Lily Bunny a jar of maple syrup, freshly squeezed from birch firewood, still smelling of the onions with which Mr. Squeezehard rubbed the firewood for pliability. The neighbor, Mr. Bolthead, gave Lily Bunny a huge wrench for his nuts, but the public wasn't alarmed because everyone was already nutty anyway. The fox gave Lily Bunny her notebook that she used during military activities against Lily Bunny. According to experts, the notebook's estimated value was already $10,000 as a military relic, but in truth there was no buyer and none was expected. The moles gave Lily Bunny a set of sticks for Lily Bunny's golf and promised to adjust their vision by the next referendum. Lily Bunny's car gave Lily Bunny a bicycle because she was afraid that Lily Bunny would wear her out. Lily Bunny rode his car to shops three times a day, and she hadn't enough time to engage in literature, the fine arts, and mainly ballet. The frogs on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean gave Lily Bunny their plan for a peace settlement named The Road Goes Ever On and On, and promised not to renew military activities at least till next spring, though they had again fought at the holiday table and Lily Bear again had to paint them the same color. Lily Bunny's mailbox gave Lily Bunny a huge amount of greeting cards addressed to Lily Bunny and all his neighbors, because he, as usual, snatched and swallowed the most joyful and colorful mail items from Good Newsman, the postman's bag. Giving the cards, the mailbox vindictively lifted a leg near Kolbasa and irrigated the ground at the dog's legs, exactly as the dog himself did at mailbox's leg every time Kolbasa was taken out. It was apparent that they struggled outright for the right to be Lily Bunny's favorite dog, so Lily Bunny had to buy two doggy bones now, one for Kolbasa and the second for his mailbox. However, the impression was that they would make friends soon, as they frequently barked and howled at the moon amicably. Mrs. Global Economy came for a visit and brought a whole bag of nuts for Lily Bear. Mrs. Global Economy had passed the next crisis and some breakdown, which happens to any lady at least once in a lunar month and she became appreciably cheerful. Mr. Troublesome, the lawyer, gave Lily Bunny a document stating that Lily Bunny's backyard was exempted from the right of way. He had found an opening in the law at last through which there was a possibility of not destroying Lily Bunny's house. Though Lily Bunny had already solved this problem, as you remember, he didn't want to upset Mr. Troublesome and wrote him a check for services rendered. In some cultures, gifts are not accepted as such. You always have to pay for them in some way. 
Mr. Spitman, as a gift to Lily Bunny, squared and rolled in tubes all of Lily Bunny's cash, thus finishing the second stage of his currency reform. Mr. Spitman again was selflessly rude and boorish, and informed Lily Bunny how unrecognizably old he had grown since their last meeting. Only after a while did Mr. Spitman understand that he spoke to Klepti the house gremlin, who truly did look elderly, as he was a hereditary troll. He was 950 years old, born in the time of the Vikings, and casually delivered to Lily Bunny's house with the luggage from Lily Bunny's old house in Scandinavia, where Lily Bunny had lived happily for some time. Klepti the house gremlin was flattered that Mr. Spitman mixed him up with Lily Bunny. He even took the opportunity to filch Mr. Spitman's suspenders, and Mr. Spitman had to hold his trousers during the party. The moment he wanted to say a boorish toast, and, having risen from the table, lifted a wine glass in one hand and a fork with a salted mushroom in another, his trousers fell, and everybody saw that Mr. Spitman was wearing long, polka-dotted underpants with an inscription in front, Do not pass by, and another inscription behind, Do not pass through. That strongly damped his reputation as city mayor, to which office he was providently elected by the wise townspeople for life because they didn't want Mr. Spitman to plunder the city treasury immediately upon his election. Monsieur Sivouple gave Lily Bunny goodwill and greetings from Monsieur almost Napoleon himself. He also gave back Lily Bunny's tube, and Lily Bunny with pleasure returned his parrots to it. The parrots began their third honeymoon observing stars that, in truth, had become a little bit displaced in the sky since their last observation. The professors of cosmology gave Lily Bunny an honorary diploma as professor of cabbage soup and allowed him to cut the tape opening their new cabbage soup accelerator, which they started up to prove to everybody, finally, that they were professors, not just a bunch of people puttering around. Mademoiselle Cultural Differences gave Lily Bunny an embroidered skullcap in the style of the Jewish kippah and joyfully danced with him the Greek dance Sirtaki, turning into the Jewish dance Freilix. The Fish 007 gave Lily Bunny six jars of first-class Riga Sprats, not the Sprats they make somewhere in Estonia that are impossible to eat, but the real ones that are very possible to enjoy eating. This action, in the Fish's 007 opinion, would lower Lily Bunny's fish thirstiness for a time, giving the fish an opportunity to regroup for the next round of espionage thrills. Mr. Hugeman, the local bedbug, for the sake of old times, wrote a satirical greeting that made Beja the cat cry, even though she was remarkable for the excessive cheerfulness peculiar to all idiots. The country that stole the berry pie gave Lily Bunny a mold for baking berry pies, fashioned like a boomerang with vertical risers. The moment the pie was ready, the mold would rise 40,000 feet in the air and deliver the pie to the country that stole the berry pie. That supported the permanent civil war there, without which the citizens of the state would be extremely uncomfortable. Their habit of going to sleep to the sounds of cannonade and waking up to the sounds of single shots caused them acute nostalgia as soon as they were deprived of this accompaniment. And an opportunity to shoot down the neighbor and go unpunished was one of the integral advantages of civil war, simply impossible to refuse. Mrs. Softdrink gave Lily Bunny a bottle of lemonade, but she asked him not to publish this fact, which could break the established status quo of everybody drinking fizzy drinks. So just forget at once what I said and continue to guzzle those unnatural drinks. By the way, fizzy drinks clean the green patina off copper perfectly. I suggest washing the domes of the architectural monuments of St. Petersburg and Copenhagen with fizzy drinks. Mr. Fast Food gave Lily Bunny a gift coupon for one hamburger sandwich and told him that Lily Bunny as a spy was to have his coupon always on hand in case he encountered a situation in which he would be required to self-destroy immediately. A hamburger sandwich operates faster than potassium cyanide. You swallow it and run to the toilet at once. Your enemies will wait and wait for you, and will eventually go away. Lily Bunny's samovar gave him a tea strainer, and Lily Bunny was as pleased as a child. And in the evening the philosophers of all times and peoples gathered in Lily Bunny's pavilion and sang together the song, Frost, O oh Frost, Don't Freeze, despite the rather hot weather. Such minor discrepancies should never confuse true philosophers. Descartes, who specially arrived to get Lily Bunny's acquaintance, sang louder than anybody did, because he wished to prove his existence. It goes like this, I sing, therefore I exist, else who is bawling so loudly? Lily Bunny was very glad to receive all these visitors and gifts, but can you imagine his pleasure when his favorite cow, Peggy, appeared in the sky, hastening to return from the south before the end of summer, precisely in time for Lily Bunny's birthday, 
which became International Lily Bunny Day.